Welcome to you. Happy Friday. Uh, joining the Film Threat live cast here on a, a on a on July first. We made it. We made it, folks. It's July first. I'm excited that you're here today to talk to us about. Uh, Alan and I will be discussing our early reactions to Thor: Love and Thunder, plus reviews of films like Phantom of the Open, Minions: The Rise of Gru, a new indie movie Poser which is actually uh, playing at the Frida Cinema in Santa Ana, California, and playing in limited release. We'd like you to know about your indie films that are out there for you to see. In addition, Dan Mervish, that's right, Dan Mervish, the legend. Dan Mervish is joining us today on the live cast to chat with us about his new indie film, 18 and a half, about, somehow some it's about President Nixon. Trust me, um, it's also a comedy. Can't wait to chat with you about so many things. We made it. Also, we're going to be discussing, because no one else will be discussing this movie. Louis C.K. has a new movie. He made a secret film kind of on the on the sly. He made the secret film called Fourth of July, and it's uh, coming out. And I think the timing could not be better. Hey, you're free to be indie with Film Thread. Thank you for joining me, and let's get this thing started as I look for our little beginning video here. Yeah, this is how we start the show. Hey everyone, I am Chris Gore from Film Thread. I am happy you are spending your Friday, could be morning for you if you're on the West Coast, it's around 9 a.m. here, just after 9 a.m. If you're on the East Coast, you're maybe thinking about lunch. Where are you going to go? Are you going to go to Cha-Cha's? Are you going to go to TGI Fridays? Where are you going for? I'm sorry. I just saw Office Space again, and I can't get over all this stuff. Jennifer Aniston is so good in that movie when she's reprimanded by her boss, played by Mike Judge, because she doesn't have enough flair on, on, her, uh, on her outfit there. But today, as always, as well, mostly, not all the time, because Alan is a man about the town. He's traveling to film festivals. He's going off to premieres. He's doing all sorts of crazy things. So sometimes he's on the show. I'm happy he's on the show today. Alan, hey. editor-in-chief of Film Thread. How's it going, man? Good. Hey, I just saw RRR. What did you think about it? Wait, why did you bring that up? Did you really? <laughs> no, I just, I'm just kidding. Well, no, I, you know, we have to always talk about RRR. Well, I mean, it comes up. I mean, I, you know, it comes up in conversation because it is one of the best films of the year and um, more people need to see it. And so I'm pleased that I'm not the only person talking about that movie. But we have other also, movies. Also, the about. chat wants to know when we're going to bring it up. So I, I figured I'd just bring it up right let's off just, the bat. Let's just get it out of the way right away <laughs> so we can get like right to it. And, and just for that, Alan, here's what the audience <laughs> really wants. Now, that theme song <laughs> reminds me that our incredible show on Wednesday, where we began our charges against Disney and Lucasfilm for the murder of the Star Wars franchise, we will be beginning that show in the coming weeks. We really have a lot of planning to do. Um, I was inundated, and I want to tell everybody, I was inundated with um, emails and messages from people. Just so you know, I'm very chatty on YouTube and on podcasts. But in like when it comes to email, you might get one word or a, a phrase. I'm not very chatty on email. I like to be chatty here with you and and converse. But when it comes to email and and that kind of communication, I'm pretty right to the point. But I got a lot of emails and messages from people who want to be defendants of Lucasfilm and Disney, and we need defendants. I also had two incredible artists reach out to me to be our sketch artists for the courtroom case. So it's not just going to be people arguing for the prosecution and for the for the defense. We're going to have a court sketch artist for each show drawing not just people that are presenting their case, but also drawing some of the things that we're discussing. And we have to figure out what to do with that art. Obviously, the artists own their own art, but I, I'd love for them to get some attention for their work. So... Um, just know I'm sifting through the messages. If I don't get back to you within about a day or two, message me again. 
because I, I may have missed it and I like to be very thorough with the email. Now, let's get a bunch of stuff out of the way because we're about to talk about Thor, our early reaction to Thor Love and Thunder. And it is not going to be a full review. This is just our early reaction to what, Al, what we thought. Alan and I saw it on Wednesday. Uh, but real quick, um, I also want to let you know, hey, this, uh, this is uh, something that's pretty cool. Alan and I are going to be at the Newport Beach Film Festival in October. Mm -hmm. So uh, if so, what I want to let you know about that is Alan and I will be at that festival. If you are a filmmaker, you've got two weeks left to submit to this festival. And Film Threat is a media sponsor of this festival. What does that mean? It just means that Alan and I are going to be there and we'll be doing panels. And it's just another opportunity to hang out with us and see movies and whatnot. Um, so you can submit your movie to the Newport Beach Film Festival at filmfreeway.com slash Newport Beach Film Festival or go to Newport Beach filmfestival.com. I have a little, uh, it, and it's going to be fun. Alan and I have been there. They put on an amazing event. Uh, this is just a quick tease of that event. Newport Beach was the perfect setting for an international film festival. Kate Beckinsale. Benedict Cumberbatch. I'm Milo Ventimiglia, and you're the Newport Beach Film Festival. It's more than a place, it's a way of life. You don't have to twist my arm to get me to Newport Beach, it's beautiful. Newport Beach, stepping it up. Okay, that looks like a really fancy, like upscale event. But trust me, even the, yeah. even the Courtyard Marriott in Newport Beach is pretty nice. So uh, yeah. Alan and I are both going to be there. We'll be um, doing some panels. And if you're a filmmaker, uh, the one thing I love about Newport Beach is they're not just about the big independent films. I and mean, you saw mm -hmm. people like Benedict Cumberbatch there and whatnot. But also they support s a smaller micro indie films. Not, they absolutely not do. Yeah, there's nothing stopping you. Like, roll the dice and submit your movie to this yeah. festival. I, I, I will tell you, uh, there was a film I saw there called High School Musical: The Shooting, and it was a musical about a high school. It's a musical about a high school shooting, and um, you cannot see it because it got canceled. But it was <laughs> able to screen at the Newport Beach Film Festival. Well, I, I like festivals that champion smaller mm. indie movies. Festivals like Slam Dance, festivals like South by Southwest are still, even though they show big stuff, they make sure to pay attention to your Absolutely. smaller up and coming indies. And this is one of those. And Alan and I will be there. I'm even surprised mm -hmm. we were like invited to be a part of it. But I know they um, reached out to us. So they reached out to us and uh, we really appreciate that. So uh, join us. It's also fun, like when we go like to the AMC Burbank 16, which is where we saw Thor Love and Thunder. It's always fun to like run into people like, hey, I watch your show on YouTube. Keep it up. I like what you're doing. And, and I, I love I love hearing that. So thank you for that. Also, a couple quick messages. If you like free stuff, send us a self-addressed stamped envelope to film threat. 5042 Wilshire Boulevard, PMB 1500, Los Angeles, California, 90036. I'll send you some free stuff. I'll send you this bumper sticker. Do people still put bumper stickers on their car? Because I do. So I do, Alan. I do that. So uh, send us that because I like, I always love getting free stuff as a kid and I like to give free stuff away. Also, if you want to contact us for any reason, it's uh, very easy. Go to filmthreat.com slash contact. Please be specific because it goes to like a bunch of people. Ask like, I want to talk to Chris or like quick question for Alan <clears throat> or, or whatever. Alan, like, where'd you get that cool shirt? I will answer that question for you. I will answer that question for you about where Alan got that cool shirt. <laughs> Once I can find the, can find the, the oh, yeah, yeah. here it is. Yeah. Film thread t-shirts cure nudity on contact. I am wearing, of course, because it's 4th of July weekend. I'm wearing our very patriotic free to be indie film threat shirt with our, you know, it's, it's an American flag in the, in the, in the background of this logo. And I suggest you, you can pick up that shirt. 
you can pick up, you know, uh, the shirt that Alan is wearing and we're adding more shirts too as well and, and other merch. So uh, support the channel by going and go to shop.filmthreat.com and pick that up. And then also if you want to get notifications about when we go live on YouTube or just like emails about like what we're up to, go to filmthreat.com slash newsletter, sign up for our newsletter. We're film thread on everything. I don't think I need to say that, but I also want to remind people, I want to remind people because, you know, you know, we're here on YouTube, right? But film threat lives as a website and it's a website that is updated every day. Thanks to the hard work of Alan Ng and about 30 writers from all over, all over like, Re and, and you can read, there's about three to five new reviews daily on the Film Threat website, thanks to Alan and, and you know, the, the Film Threat team there. And so, you know, scroll through the front page. You're going to see a lot of indie films you would never read about anywhere else. All really interesting stuff. A lot of movies playing at film festivals. This is from the Nude Tuesday. What is Nude Tuesday, Alan? Oh, that's from uh, that actually uh, premiered at Tribeca this year, but it's uh, kind of a nude road adventure. A nude road adventure. See, where yeah. would you ever hear about a nude road adventure that played at the Tribeca Film Festival? Also, um, you know, indie horror films, lots of uh, documentaries. This is from Dances with Films, which is a festival that we aggressively covered recently. Another Tribeca review, Carol and Johnny. What's that one about? It's a. Uh, couple it's a documentary about a couple who decide that they're going to go on kind of a heist spree across the uh, across the country oh. all right this uh, is interesting yeah this is a good one keep the cameras rolling the pedros are more away okay i remember pedro was on the was it the san francisco real world yes in yes the i think it was season two i think it was season, season two. two season two of the real world was in san francisco and and Pedro, um, of course, on the show, learned that he uh, had AIDS and it played out, you know, during that season. So uh, I'm sure that it's a that's a fascinating documentary yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of other stuff here, horror films and whatnot. So if you want to like if you want to impress your friends and really be ahead of the game, uh, read our read the website, read the website and and check out cool stuff there. All right. Let's get to Thor, because I know that that's why there's. 200 people watching us live as we speak smash that like button make and subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed you know um we're trying to we're trying i'd love i'd love to get to fifty thousand at some point i mean we're getting close we're getting there we're getting there and we're slowly growing the channel and we appreciate all your support whether you're simply watching or you're you know throwing us a super chat or you're buying a t-shirt or you're sending me a self-addressed stamped envelope. Also, by the way, if you send a really, really large envelope, I'll send like DVDs. I just mailed off this week, some big packages to people. I'm like, well, if it fits in the envelope, I'm throwing in some DVDs. So, so there you go. And we want to say hi to some of the people in the chat here before we get started. Dempsey says happy early independence day. Thank you for that. We've got uh, Shock as Juan. Loved you on John's show yesterday. Thank you. Yes, I was on John Campia's show. I keep getting invited to other people's shows. I do Midnight's Edge in the morning. On Mondays, I do Nerdrotic Nooner with Gary Beekler of Nerdrotic. And I was on John Campia's show. We ran into each other. Um, I've known John for years. He invited me on the show. What I like about John, he lets me be myself, you know, at his own risk. <laughs> so there you go masters of the nerddom film threat the highlight of my week shelby ac we need a film threat bingo card yes rrr is the center square yes yeah, somebody make a film threat bingo <laughs> card flaccid phoenix yeah i'm producer, looking Leia up there yeah yeah our producer moderator in the chat now uh flaccid phoenix could we make a bingo card and maybe we could post it in the community tab on on the film threat channel here turo turo i got your messages they're, I'm going to respond to them. Give me some time here, Turo. Alan getting checks for RRR. Dempsey, Alan nipple video is the main reason for living. Um, we are going to make a two-hour loop of just that video. Um, Justice Buttcrack for 99 cents super sticker. Thank you for that. Our super stickers are fun. They're very fun. Jack D. Ripper Thor with an RRR. 
Love that. Uh, Scott Slaughterback, Newport Beach is a bit hoity-toity for little old me. I was there once. I felt underdressed in polo shirt and khakis. First of I all, I always Scott, feel underdressed there. <laughs> first of all, Scott Slaughterback, this is why I just keep a blazer in my car. I can throw it on. I look nearly fancy, and also I don't care. Whenever I go to like, this is gonna, this is gonna be like an old school thing. But whenever I go to stuff like that, I feel like when Laverne and Shirley or like some character from a sitcom goes to like, uh, like they're on a yacht or something fancy and they're just like the sort of blue collar. I always feel that way. So Scott, uh, sidle up to me. I'll bet that there's a dive bar in Newport Beach that no one knows about. There has oh, there's to be bars everywhere. There's bars everywhere in Newport Beach. You can find yes, any I don't want to pay $14 for a Moscow mm -hmm. mule. Okay. Um, and ladies, man, 727 says, no spoilers, no spoilers, no spoilers. There will be no spoilers. This is early reaction, which is all you're going to get out of us. Yeah. And uh, Turo says, there needs to be a things Alan says video <laughs> for sure. Craig Wilson for $4.99 says, charge identity theft, Ray Skywalker. Ooh. Yeah, I think, think that's on there. I, I think, I think, that I think on that's there. on there. We are going to hone that. We're going to be posting it in our community tab and on social media. These are the charges I've invited people. I'm surprised at the number of people that want to defend Lucasfilm Disney. It's going to be a great, great uh, show when we launch it. I'm really looking forward to you joining us for that. And Flaccid Phoenix says, we want our nude road adventure yeah. of Chris and Alan. I bet you do. Well, I mean, there is a new video I could debut today. Should I? I don't know if I should debut this. I don't know. Is there a music issue with this? Flaccid Phoenix, let, let me know. Is there a music video music issue with this video? Yeah, check we, it out and we'll bring it back. All right, it's nine seconds. What what could go wrong? There, there you go. And also it has yeah, I could just do I could just do these on my own. I don't know why you need to to make things. <laughs> All right, Alan, we've stalled enough and mainly I'm stalling because we send out a newsletter, a, a a social media posting. We want people to gather in and and so I stall at the top of the show. I'm not going to I'm just going to just straight up admit it. I stall at the top of the show because I want a lot of people in here. So, so let's actually get started with this, Alan. You and I saw <laughs> You and I saw Thor Love and Thunder uh, this past week, and we're going to give our early reactions to it. We'll respond to some of your questions in the chat. There will be no spoilers and no real details. But Alan, what is your early reaction to Thor Love and Thunder? Yeah. Well, I mean, now that we've done a few of these, I realized that uh, as I'm watching the movie, I realize I'm going to get a lot of shit in the chat for this, but I really liked Lo Thor Love and Thunder. Um, a couple things. One is uh, it doesn't bring any of this multiverse crap into it. I, I doubt that's a spoiler. But uh, and then and um, you know I think you know it's definitely on the end of this is a light, silly superhero movie, much like uh, Thor Ragnarok. And I think um, with Taika Waititi, he was able to really balance it off with the kind of the light side of Thor with the really dark side of Gore, the the God Butcher, and. Um, and then this interaction with Jane um, follows somewhat the comic book. So, you know, we, we're good there. But um, it's just a really fun ride. It's It's got a lot of humor in it. It's got a lot of adventure, a lot of fighting. Uh, and I think what I like most about it is just it's a simple comic book story. You know, it doesn't take itself way too seriously. Um, I, I think a lot of the talk leading up to it is... You know, you'll find a little bit of it there, but it's not as bad as people are saying, you know. I, I think I tend to not want to watch a lot of the reactions beforehand because, you know, for this movie, it's been pretty bad. And I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you when you finally see it. And uh, and I think you feel somewhat the same way as I do. No. Um, so here, 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 here's what I'll, here's what I'll say about it. I didn't love it as much as you did. Okay. Mm -hmm. And for this, for this reason, okay. Uh, the humor is way amped up more than yeah. Ragnarok. What I don't like about that is what it does is it reduces the stakes. It reduces the stakes. Nothing feels important because everything is a joke. And so after a while, it just, that gets tiresome. Uh, and I, what I felt at the end is this felt like an episode of the Thor Disney plus TV show. 
I'm not saying that in a bad way necessarily. It just doesn't feel like a movie. I feel like movies come with a bit more weight. They're not as you know prevalent as just like, well, here's another episode of a show. And this felt like another episode of the Thor ongoing adventures on television. I will say this. Chris Hemsworth is great as this character. I do like a character that receives a lot of abuse. I wish that... Um, Disney slash Marvel would learn that, you know, your female characters should really be faced with more struggle rather than winning all the time. If you look at a movie like Indiana Jones or excuse me, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, they've retitled that movie, you know, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I will just say that forever. He doesn't win in that movie at all. He's constantly browbeaten. He's just like, he fails at every turn other than discovering the Ark and saying, close your eyes at the end, he really is just, you know, faced with challenges in which he fails. And um, Chris Hemsworth as Thor, he's good at that. He has failed in many ways. Um, and that's good. It, it's it's endearing to a character. This is why the female characters in the Marvel Universe are not, are, are not as, I don't think they're as popular. And they don't resonate because part of uh, being on a journey like this is you see a character fail and you feel for them. You want them to triumph rather than winning all the time isn't interesting. It's not interesting. It's not interesting in real life. It's not interesting in, 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 in a story. It's like you want to face challenges. You want to overcome. So um, I will say this. I, I know what you were implying earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of the, the people are thinking this is a bait and switch. It is not. This is Thor's movie. Mm -hmm. Both Valkyrie, um, Tessa Thompson, and you know Jane Foster, Natalie Portman, they are side characters. They are side characters through and through. What I think has been, the assumption has been that they're going to overtake Thor. That doesn't happen. In a way, it almost reminds me of the way that the latest James Bond movie was marketed. The latest James Bond movie was marketed as like, this Wolf is James 007. <laughs> She's going to take over. That didn't happen in the movie. And the way it was marketed was to placate a certain audience. And I'm not, I'm not saying that that's necessarily what they're doing, but there's an assumption now that doesn't happen. So I think that that was a pleasant surprise that the female characters didn't overshadow Thor. This is Thor's story. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think because the movie cannot even have a serious moment for a minute, it, it just is too jokey, too over the top. I think Christian Bale is great as gore. I love watching people talk about Thor because inevitably gore will come up. And I think of myself. Yeah. What can I say? No, but I think, I think it was the gore elements that did bring the seriousness to it that it needed. You know, you couldn't have True. a jokey film all the way through. And and I do like the fact that, you know, gore at least, uh, and I'm, I'm referring, I'm going to say things that are in the comic book somewhat. So, okay. but but the idea that that there is a credible threat to Thor's existence in this movie. And I think that's what, at least story-wise, made it, uh, you know, made it stand out and made it beyond just a jokey film. You know, uh, Thor's, Thor's hilarious adventure across the universe, and and I yeah. I like that a lot. Well, we'll get into it more. We'll do a full review mm -hmm. a week from today when when the movie opens. We'll do a full review, and we'll do a full review with spoilers. Okay, but there are a bunch of things that didn't quite work. And, and I'm not going to say it's completely like there's like, oh, like I, I'm actually enjoying this. Right. I mm -hmm. think the Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, the, you know, the characters from Guardians of the Galaxy are used very well. And I will say one thing I really love is the goats. <laughs> the goats, whoever did the voice of the goats is great. So, so there <laughs> are these things where it's just like, oh, you know what? I'm having a good time. But it, it's like I, I, I felt it's kind of forgettable at the end. At the end, I was just like, well, that was fun. But it didn't leave me going like, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? And let me answer a question I know that you're going to ask. This is not a spoiler, but this is a question I've been asked. Does this lay out, does Thor Love and Thunder lay out with the next big threat in the Marvel Universe? Like, what's, what's on the horizon? What is Phase 4 leading to? Nothing. It doesn't lay it out. There are no answers. And unless, I mean, unless I missed something, because I did go to the bathroom once, and I may have gotten some popcorn. I'm just saying that it doesn't, there are no answers about 
like where this is going. As far as like phase four movies, I don't know. Spider Man No Way Home, that's considered phase four. Is that considered part yes. of a phase? It's considered. Uh, I know it's Sony. yeah, because it was the it was the first of the uh, the multiverse idea. Okay. Even though there right, wasn't so a multiverse in it, I, I would say that this is among the better of the Phase Four movies. I mean, Spider Man No Way Home being, um, I don't know what the rules are and what's considered. I guess that's considered Phase Four because it's, you know, Doctor Strange is in it. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Feel free to mock me in the chat <laughs> for not knowing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, the second best or at least most entertaining of the phase four movies, but the bar's pretty low. You know, the bar's yeah. pretty low. Um, Eternals, pro and the, the, uh, the one on the positive side I'll say about this, the movie is an hour and 59 minutes. Doesn't overstay its welcome. It's not like one of these things where it's like two hours and 20 minutes and doesn't need to be that. It's like, nope, tight two hours. Boom, in, you're out. Um, we're gonna go into more detail and do a full review next week. That's our early reactions. I'm sort of lukewarm to positive, good time, but it just, I think part of my um, lukewarm reaction to it has less to do with the movie and more to do with the fact that like, I may just be burned out on Marvel, you know? Yeah, I may maybe. Be burned out on Marvel. Let's go to the chat here. And Matthew A. Kobo says, put that art on t-shirts. Yeah, we need to do a um, we need to do a critics court t-shirt. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> Alan just likes to have fun, says Internet I, Rec Room. Jack, why, Jack, what's wrong with fun? What is wrong with fun? Right? Yeah, Alan just wants to have fun. Jack the Ripper, Alan no. thinks about us while he watches movies. He loves us. I love you guys. I love there you. There you go. All. Lil Movie Perp says, is this where the salty fanboys hang out and complain about not being pandered to anymore? Um <laughs> Uh, are are we so. salty fanboys? I don't know. I think uh, there are channels that do that better than us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also, I don't care. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, I, I don't know. I I'm not exactly yeah. sure. Um, yeah. Here we go. Bethel Games says, Alan like Thor. Okay, you can skip Thor. No, <laughs> I wouldn't say that no. necessarily. If you like Ragnarok, Rock, you're going to like this one, definitely. Well, I like, I like, I, I, I don't know. I think I may well, have the liked tone Ragnarok at least. a little better. Ragnarok, okay. I liked a little bit better. Uh, Fat Elvis, it's a triumph. We'll go into more detail. Two slapstick says Internet Rec Room. I would say parts of it are for sure. For the most part, no. It's it's basic battles, yeah. Masters of the Nerddom. Did the visuals improve the movie from the trailer? No. Jack T. River. Emotional moments are undercut by a silly joke. Classic Marvel. Yeah, that's that's. But it is freedom punk says how do you have gore as the villain and not have a serious moment there are serious moments with gore gore is all the serious moments uh, yeah pretty much all the serious moments are given to gore and all the goofy slapstick uh, is is thor sean zamir says honestly do you think bale is happy with this movie this was his joker to his batman um i don't know if he's happy he seemed to be i did watch the He's, I watched the red carpet. He seemed to be very happy. I think he just wanted a movie like he wanted to be in a Marvel movie. A lot of actors yeah. want to be there. Well, I mean, uh, the sense was that he got in and got out. I mean, he did his job, and I think he had fun doing it, just not being the, the center of attention, so to speak, for a movie. Uh, Masters of the Nerddom, humor is good in a movie, but not at the expense of scenes that call for intensity to give the impression of high-stakes moments. I think that's the... That's what concerns me is that there just seems to be no stakes, right? They're just, they're, you know, it just is like, okay. Gabe Oitacher, what are Molnir's preferred pronouns? I wouldn't know that. Adam Nowakowski, Chris, I've been watching you since Collider Heroes. RIP John Schnepp. I love John Schnepp. Love that man. And uh, think about him every day. And especially going to Comic-Con. Uh, he was supposed to be, you know, in 2018 when he passed away, it was just week. It was just like a few weeks before Comic-Con. Maybe like even like a week before Comic-Con. He was supposed to be on a panel. He was supposed to be on a panel with us. The panel was called The Last, Last Jedi Debate. And I believe that the video of that, is there a video? There might be a video or at least the audio on our YouTube channel and he was supposed to be there. And, uh, it was, uh, it was sort of tough to get through that panel knowing he was supposed to be on it. 
Sean Zamir for Buck 99 says Bale underutilized the best May villain ever. Mar Mar maybe we need Marvel villain. Uh, mm. Douglas A. Burton, Chris Allen, how many stars out of 10? Uh, I give it an eight. David. You give it an eight? I give it an eight. I had fun. I had fun. I'm sorry. I would I would say six and a half, you know, to seven. And that's like, that's just being generous of, like I had a good time, but just like, I feel like Marvel's just in the churning of this out. And I know that they shot most of Thor, they shot most of Thor Love and Thunder in the volume, which is that sort of like fake, it's it's like a giant LED screen, mm -hmm. right? And you can actually see the background. So it's not like you green screen. It's like the actors can see like, oh, look at this giant vista. But, yeah. and then it does look like they're filming on a set. They're definitely on. But I feel like, you know, Pixar used to have this problem where they were churning out such great movies that when they put out a good movie, everyone hated it because it was only good. While right. DC and Mar Warner Brothers at the time, they had a very low bar to cross. And yeah. so we like we tend to like the bad movies so much better because they were churning out such garbage at the time, early on. Adventure Industries, to what movie would you suggest for the Jul for a July 4th matinee? We've already seen Maverick. I would suggest seeing Maverick again. If you can see RRR, go see that. If you can see Marcel, the, shoe, the, the shell with shoes okay. on, go see that. Because I think, well, I don't think it opens wide until the 15th of yeah. July. Um, and, and we're going to review a movie that if you have kids, it would. We have a movie for you. Uh, Sean Zamir for Buck ninety nine. Could we have lived without this movie? It doesn't. The, the only thing it really advances is Jane Foster's story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's sort of a redemption. It's sort of a Thor coming to terms with himself story, which is every Thor movie now. Right, yeah. Thor's got to like. Learn something about himself, and I guess. Well, that that's the nature of being a god. Every you know? time, huh? That's so, the nature of being a god. You know, it's, you know, Ms. Captain Marvel is just too powerful, and you can't. But God is Thor is a god, and that's the only thing you can do with all powerful characters is is to beat them down a bit and give them some kind of emotional beat to to chase at this point because they're just too powerful. Giggles and bit says I liked Ragnarok until he couldn't beat the villain. Yeah, there you go. Uh. Trey Brannon says, which female character did the setup a Disney Plus series for? Uh, if you want me to answer, answer honestly, maybe, maybe Valkyrie or maybe like Valkyrie. Asgard series. I don't know. Um, Thor is thousands of years old. Why is he just now finding himself? Yeah, I know. it's it's it, That seems a little weird. Um, Jack D. Ripper, I'll give Thor a chance solely based on Taika being behind it. I do mm -hmm. like Taika Waititi. Yeah. I do like he's, he's all over it. He's all over it. So. He's all over it, but it's almost like he can't get out of the way of himself to mm -hmm. let moments that should be like, I just would have liked less humor because I think it would have mm -hmm. made things more meaningful. Honestly, That's, I think you were peeing during, during some of the, the I, serious moments between Thor and Is that when I was in the bathroom? I think you were doing. Yeah, because there are certain parts you missed and uh, we had to fill in for you. So See, this, that is, must why have been the point. this is why I'm giving my full review next week because I do plan to see it again. Matthew A. Koba, what's the ranking with other Thor movies? I can we, uh, Matthew, we may have to save that for like yeah, next Yeah, let's week. save that one. Let's save that one, but we will answer that, Matthew. Thank you for that. Uh, please come back. I'm waiting for the Jeff Goldblum spinoffs as Internet Rec Room. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I want to see Game Master stuff, definitely. Why is Valkyrie a king and not a queen, says Spidey Sensei72? Yeah, I think that's dumb. I mean, I think yeah. it's dumb. Sir. Uh, yeah. <laughs> not ma'am, sir. Nikki D for five says, is Thor 4 on par with RRR Top Gun Maverick in terms of entertainment and lasting effect? I can give you with 100% certainty, no. RRR is a movie I continue to think about. RRR is the movie I've seen the most in theaters mm -hmm. this year. It's a movie I've seen six times this year. Um, and I can't stop thinking about it and recommending it to people. Top Gun Maverick, I also saw three times in the theater. Loved it. It's it's a return to sort of a classic movie that Hollywood seems incapable of making today. It's also the number one movie this year, uh, surpassing a billion dollars. And prediction, it will be the number one movie at the box office this weekend. Uh, in spite of mm -hmm. minions, which we'll get to, which we will get to, uh, do does Natalie Portman's CGI arm steal the show? They do not, and they're one hundred percent enhanced. Um, 
Matthew A. Coba, Chris missed the whole movie because he was in the bathroom. I did not miss the whole movie. I <laughs> I missed a Just scene. the important parts. Luther Talbert for five says, we are on vacation and listening to you while we drive. My kids, oh. Regan and Liam, are excited to see the Thor movie. I'm not sure about their ages. Can I just say this? They will love it. Mm -hmm. I think they will love it. I think that, like, look, I'm much more nitpicky, okay, Luther Talbert. And thank you for that. And thank you, uh, Regan and Liam. Or is it Reagan and Liam? I don't know. Reagan and Liam, please correct me. Or Regan and Liam. But Luther Talbert, uh, thank you for that. On vacation. I hope you are yeah, yeah. uh, love that. I love the family in the car driving. Used to do that myself. Yeah. And, Drive safe. You sent a super chat while you were driving. So uh, sent a super yeah, chat safe. while you're driving. I hope you're in the passenger seat, Luther. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, also, I, your kids. Your kids are gonna do goat impressions all the way home from, the, from the, Thor: the Love goats, and Thunder. The goats are perfectly used in the movie because they're not overused. It's yeah. a and it's also like how the it's goats, a running gag. Yeah. It's a running gag, and they sound because this is true in real life. Goats when they like make sounds, they almost sound like humans. They, I mean, it's very weird sounding. So I, I don't want to enjoy. Yeah, enjoy. just like, goats are really good comic relief. But here's the problem is so much of, you know, usually what you would have in a movie is you have a character that is comic relief. The problem is, is Thor has too many comic relief characters, including the lead character. Now, is that a bad thing? Your mileage on comedy may vary, but I really think your kids are going to have a good time. Geek Chat One for five says, "Can we get Beta Ray Bill now?" Uh, at some point, I think that that yeah. could happen. Um, Jack D. Ripper says, "Chris is like Jack Warner. He bases how good a film is on how many piss breaks. It's a three piss picture." Well, <laughs> depending, it depends on the movie. I really do have to like watch my intake. But yes, Jack, uh, I do have to pay attention. To that now, that's our early reaction to Thor. That is our early reaction. Um, it's not the movie, not the only movie. Uh, that's well, it's opening next week, and we will talk about it in spoiler detail next mm -hmm. week. And what I hope is, is that you have seen it by then because you'll be able to see it on Thursday. Thursday. So yeah, do early screenings, maybe even Wednesday. I don't know. There's, there's, yeah. I would think they they do it Wednesday if they were smart and want to make money. And Flaccid Phoenix reminding you, shout out to Flaccid Phoenix and his channel. Go subscribe to Flaccid Phoenix. Um, everyone needs to slap that like button to get this to 200 likes. Got over 400 people watching. That's just half of you need to do it. So, yeah, we'll we'll do our full Thor review next week. But I will say that um, I, I think that I think I think this is much more enjoyable than Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, mm -hmm. that we have multiple. Multiple problems with Multiverse of Madness. But um, Thor Love and Thunder, fun. I just wonder, where is Marvel going? Where is this all leading? Well, we may have answers. According to Kevin Feige, we're going to get answers to that soon. But those answers aren't aren't in this movie. That's for sure. Yeah. So, well, I think, I think Wakanda Forever is in November. So maybe we'll get it there. There you go. All right. Let's move on. It's not the only the, the the movie opening this weekend. And I will say this, I am not I don't know that I consider myself the target demographic for Minions the Rise of Gru, but I enjoyed this movie. I I enjoyed this movie. Um and I like a movie that is not made for kids, but is made for everyone, and I feel like this film is like that. And by the way, I only saw the first uh, movie, which was, uh, you know, uh, Despicable Me. I saw the first movie. I, I didn't see the other ones, and I've just now seen this one. So I, I feel like I'm caught up. And this is the lead character from Despicable Me as a kid wanting to join this sort of league of villains and, and sort of the journey to kind of, it's sort of him as a kid wanting to become a villain. Alan, fill us in on Minions, The Rise of yeah. Gru. I assume you saw it with your daughter. Yes, I did see it with my daughter. And and I will say uh, I did have fun, but quite frankly, if I didn't have a child, I would never have seen any of these movies. Um, <laughs> it is, I mean, that's that's the target audience here. Um, so I was literally forced to see these movies. And, and even throughout every single one of these, you know, 
I didn't feel like I was bored. There were times I was getting there. But, uh, you know, this is definitely a kid's movie. And if you have kids, you're going to have a lot of fun with it. But what one thing that really reminded me of what what rem, what brought back memories to me was my old days of sitting home watching the old Bugs Bunny cartoons and, and Three Stooges. You know, this idea of just the slapstick fun. Um, you know, the, this is kind of the return of that style of comedy where it's uh, children's movies where, you know, uh, instead of the, the duck season, rabbit season, the shotgun with Elmer Fudd and Daffy Duck, and, you know, we've got laser guns here, kind of over the top weapons and people are getting shot. Um, there's there's moments of drag, you know, the, the Bugs Bunny type drag. Um, you know, and so this is the fun, you know, that, that I kind of miss uh, that I felt like we can't do anymore in children's movies. And for some reason, the minions are able to do that. And so to me, it was just kind of harkening back to that and, and just feeling like, yeah, I'm, I'm just having fun here and, uh, plot wise, story wise, you know, th it's just a convenient way to go from one slapstick gag to the next. And, and so it's for children. And, uh, you know, if you have to drag your, if your kid drags you to see this movie, you know, you, I think you'll find yourself having a good time. Are you, uh, you're muted. I will say it's, it's, it's for children and also kids at heart, but I will say mm -hmm. like, I love when it comes to cartoons. When I was a kid, I didn't like Disney cartoons. I did not like Disney cartoons. I didn't like Mickey Mouse. I didn't like Goofy. I didn't like Donald Duck. I th found them to be just too milk toast and too mm -hmm. wholesome and kind of boring to me. I grew up on Three Stooges and Looney Tunes. Bugs yeah. Bunny, who is an irritant, Foghorn Leghorn, uh, you know, even your Tex Avery stuff. I love those classic Looney Tunes that are incredibly violent. Or, you know, the Roadrunner and the Coyote. I love yeah. that stuff. And this Minions kind of harkens back to the old school, like, you know, those kinds of cartoons where, like, there are parts of this that are very violent and over the top. But it's done in, like, this cartoony way where it's just like, this is the cartoon world. Logic is different here. Things function differently. And I... I I found myself enjoying it. I was surprised because frankly, I was not looking forward to seeing this <laughs> at all. Like I was just like, oh, sort of dreading it. Like I saw the first movie, Despicable Me. That was kind of neat. It's, um, and this was, I, I got sucked in. I, you know, I mm -hmm. enjoyed the film and there's not much more to say about that other than it was a, it was a fun ride. And, and, you know, if you if you're like me and you've got the like, this is where I kind of feel like it's sort of low cost on my end. Is like I have the AMC A list, which is like uh -huh. twenty five bucks. It's twenty five bucks in California. I think it's cheaper in other parts of the country. And you just pay the one price, and you can see three movies a week. And I'm like, oh, that was fun because I love going to the movies. Um, you know, heartbreak feels good in a place like this. Like, uh, you know what I'm saying? The Nicole Kidman, that little, you know that. Everybody cheers and claps and laughs when that comes on. Heartbreak feels good in a place like this. But if you've got the A-list, you know, go and check it out. I, th I thought it was fun, and I was surprised how much I enjoyed it. Let's go to your comments in the chat here before we move on to our next review. Uh, Michael Seeger says, Daffy would get slapped and his bill would wind up on the other side of his head. Yeah, they were incredibly violent. Yeah. And, and oh, no, Daffy Duck got his face shot, you know, with a shotgun, and then the bill moved up. And Yeah, so, so it was more than a slap. It was a, it was a shotgun. The duck season, rabbit season thing. <laughs> I love duck season, rabbit season. I love that. Yeah, uh, Red Terror 1978 says, Looney Tunes was much better. Yeah. I'll picture a little Ryan Cannell there. There you go. Internet Rec Room says Bugs Bunny greater than Mickey Mouse. Agreed. I mean, I mm -hmm. can't, when I think of like great cartoons, I don't think of like, oh my God, remember that moment in the Mickey Mouse cartoon where he's running the boat, Steamboat Willie? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think about, when I think of great moments in cartoons, I can't think of ones from Disney films. Um, but I can think of ones from so many countless, like, you know, whether it's a Roadrunner, you know, Wile E. Coyote, Acme. I, I love the stuff with Acme. Mm -hmm. And I love that they're, and, and the thing is, is like Minions leans into that. Minions leans into that 
type of cartoon where the stakes are high and and it's it's violent and it, it's fun. It was fun. Uh, Matthew A. Coble, MCU Minion Cinematic Universe. <laughs> there Brock is one. I mean, they're definitely there building it. Yeah, Brock Samson. Universal is eating Disney's lunch, both in park revenue as well as the box mm -hmm. office. Yeah, you're right. I'm actually thinking. I'm thinking of going to Universal. Thinking of going to Universal. Uh, I have not been to a theme park since the before times, with the exception of Knotts. Uh, so there you go. Buck ninety nine from Shazamir. Minions, another factory film. In your opinion. Um, is it a factory film? I mean, yeah, but I mean, it could, it could be considered that like just sort of churning it out, but I don't know. I had a good time. I, what I really love is the design. We haven't talked about like the character design of the villains. Each of them has like sort of a different, like each of them alone could be their own bond villain. You've got the guy who has like the lobster arm and the girl who's sort of like your sort of black exploitation, uh, character from the seventies, like. I really liked all the villains. They were very distinct. Yeah. My favorite was uh, Nunchucks. <laughs> yeah, Nunchucks. A woman who's a nun who fights with Nunchucks. These are the villains. It's like this league of villains. Um, and and uh, Gru is trying to join the villains. He wants to be a part of their organization as a kid. He's like 11 years old or something. Solomon Thorne says, I know one thing, Minions, is going to blow Lightyear out of the water. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and oh, uh, Nobody asked this. There's nothing woke about it. Is there? Hmm. Did you notice, Alan? Well, I mean, just the fact that there's so much violence in it toward toward each of the characters that, you know, that that violates wokeness automatically. The use of weapons, uh, you know, this idea of the Second Amendment and uh, the ability to ha arm yourself with laser weapons. Yeah. You know, that's just, not woke at all. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, I had more fun watching this than Lightyear for yeah. sure. Sean Zemir says, you guys are the best when it comes to breaking movies down and being unbiased and not settling. Well, thank you for that. I try to give our thank honest you. opinions here. Um, Adventure Industries, is this a good movie to bring my two moms? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bring your bring your two moms to see Minions. For sure. Yeah, because because apparently two moms are not going to see Lightyear. So. Uh, Bear Down Adam asks a serious question. Should I bring my six-year-old to see Lightyear or Minions this weekend? Alan. Minions. Minions, minions, absolutely, hundred percent minions. He's you, just going to sit there giggling. He or she is going to be it, just sitting there giggling. Here's one thing that that I really like about the minions movies that is kind of under us is the way that the minions talk. They kind of have mm -hmm. like their own language, but you'll like hear a word here and there that you kind of recognize, and it's goofy mm -hmm. and it's weird. And yeah, your six year old will love minions out of the just sheer. Over yeah. the topness of it, you can't take the violence in the film seriously because it's cartoon violence, right? There's no guns, guns per se, but there's threat, right? There's the threat of something, but it's mm -hmm. done in such a cartoony way. Um, yeah, a uh, hundred percent minions. I feel like Lightyear for a six year old is just going to be they're going to get bored one because it's too long. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like what hour 45, hour 50 for Lightyear, whereas Minions is like a yeah. 90 minutes. Yeah, I mean, uh, and even if you take out the controversial part of Lightyear, Minions moves quickly. It's it's for the ADD and kids. Yeah. You know, it, it it doesn't take a break. And so there's there's constant engagement, especially for young children. And nobody asked, but I can confirm this. If you go to the bathroom, you're not going to miss anything. <laughs> you can just come right back and it picks right up. Yeah. Like, just, oh, I'm caught up with just, what's happening. That person did. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, Chud Life says the director of the movie voices all the minions. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Chud Life. Yeah, that voice is so yeah. weird and f I don't know. I just uh, I found we, it. In we were trying to figure out the we were trying to figure out the origins of it. I assume it's Italian, but I'm wondering if it's, there's some Spanish in there. I don't know. Yeah, it's it just it's just it's just gibberish with a few words. You understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is why I think it's it's yeah. And there I've heard estimates. Of this movie this weekend will be making you know 90 million over the four day weekend could um 70 mm -hmm. million. definitely going to do better than lightyear did in its first weekend yeah thank you for that chud life appreciate that fact and another reminder from flaccid phoenix to slap that like button did we hit 200 likes yet i hope we did got like 400 people watching yeah that's great wow. uh welcome and oh wait a sec 
Zach says, what's our Allen nipple count at? First of all, very good question. We do need to, we do, let's, let's. You know, Alan, the way you're placed in the frame when that video comes up, you could literally, you could almost lick yourself. You could almost, <laughs> get, no, try it, try it. Let's okay, see. Okay, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. All right, all right, all right. Uh, yeah, the, the nipple count, I think we've shown it like three times now. So there you go. Thank Plus you Plus the new one. Plus we did the new one, so. Exactly. All right. Switching gears here for a moment. We're going to reset here. We're going to talk about a movie that could be controversial. We're going to talk about a movie that could be considered controversial. Wait, is this, which should I? Yeah, right. probably this is the better one. Yeah, here we go. Uh, we're going to talk about Louis C.K. made a secret movie. He made a secret movie. I believe it opens um, opens the next couple weeks. It's called Fourth of July. It takes place over Fourth of July weekend, and I, I you know, we may be putting ourselves at risk, Alan, by just reviewing this movie. <laughs> Have we and reached this... a place now that like you can't even? You know, you're gonna you're gonna catch hell just for, you know, reviewing a film from someone who's canceled. I know. I mean, this this is the reason it's uh it's controversial. That's the only reason this movie is controversial. And it's like, you know, it's like having Mel Gibson in your movie. You know, and uh, yeah, we, I don't know how we've gotten to this point. I don't know how we've gotten to this point either. But um, the movie actually opens in theaters today, today, which is July first. So the film is in theaters. I believe it hits digital shortly after. This is a limited theatrical release. It's actually playing um, at the Lemle Monica Film Center in Santa Monica. So Louis mm -hmm. C.K.'s movie opening in a theater today. And uh, I've seen very few reviews or coverage of this movie. So there you go. Um, Let's get into the story. Alan, why don't you tell us the basic story of this film? I, I related to aspects of it, oddly enough. Yeah. Yeah, let me... Um, I just want to get the guy's name. Yeah, so Joe List stars in this movie. Uh, he he co-wrote it with Louis C.K. It's basically a guy who's been uh, living in in New York for a long time with his wife. And, um, and for this 4th of July weekend, uh, he's going back home to his family. And he's decided that he's going to confront his family about how messed up he was or how messed up he is as a person today because of them, because of the family dynamic and the reason he had to leave and get out of his family. Today's the day he's, he's going to be a man, going to be a future father, and he's going to go and finally stand up for himself. And that's he goes home and that's what he does. He right off the bat, he lays it all out. And and the whole movie is just kind of the repercussions now of, of his actions. Yeah, so he so Joe List is in it who plays kind of a and I'll say that's the basic story. I mean, they're mm -hmm. all like from Boston and they all have yeah. that like accent, uh very aggressive like, Boston types. Yeah, yeah, and they're all alcoholics, all drinking. And the character, I should say, he's a jazz musician who's struggling with alcoholism. He's in AA, he his uh, 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 an acquaintance of his becomes becomes a sponsor of this friend of his friend slash acquaintance and and it's kind of nursing him through that he and his wife are having conflicts where they can't really their 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 relationship is sort of at this sort of weird standstill louis ck is actually in the movie briefly he plays uh the psychiatrist therapist. the therapist right and sort of puts himself in there the one thing um before we get into it too much i'll say louis ck really wants to be woody allen he wants to be Woody yeah. Allen. He uses these little like needle drops of like, you know, experimental jazz music kind of throughout to, to express emotion. And the way he tells the story, it's very much shot in like these like long takes, right? Which is a, a mm -hmm. Woody Allen style. Um, there's nothing in this. If you're thinking that this movie is some sort of apology for Louis C.K.'s behavior, it isn't. He did do a comedy special, which is available on his website. If you just Google Louis, I think it's just louisck.com. Um, his latest comedy special is called Sorry. And I believe you can buy it for $5. But 
My assumption is, is that what Louis is going to do is do this limited theatrical release to get some reviews. And then you'll be able to see this movie uh, mm -hmm. on video on demand and more than likely be able to get it through his website. I don't think there's anything. He's not saying anything. No lines in the movie kind of stood out to me as mm -hmm. being anything controversial. I will say I was kind of like, it, it just felt like and maybe an You'd episode. Before. It <laughs> felt like a less funny episode of the Louis show, which I actually quite enjoyed the Louis show on FX. I actually really like that show. So this is like a less funny version of that because it deals with this character played by Joe list. who's trying to like resolve the issues he has with his family. He's, you know, he's kind of blames them for, you know, how messed up he is. And I think partially that's true, but he needs to be accountable. It reminds me mm -hmm. of, reminds me of like, basically Louis CK made a whole movie about one of my favorite scenes in another movie. Can I explain? I believe that when we, when we become an adult, at some point we need to separate from our parents. There's a time of separation. It usually happens when kids are teens or early twenties. You need to, and I'm going to say this in the nice way, you need to tell your parents to F off in a way. You, you say that, right? And you say it, but you're not saying it with, with hate. You're saying it with like, I am my own person. Uh, I love you, but I, I I don't need you. I'm my own person. This is me telling you I can take care of myself. And, and I feel like that's partially what's being said. There's a movie starring Matthew Lillard called SLC Punk. You can actually look up the clip online. And in the clip, Matthew Lillard, who has this big mohawk in the movie, and SLC Punk is like this classic punk uh, drama um, set in Salt Lake City. Oddly enough, explains the title. But Matthew Lillard tells his parents, he just sort of, he just, you know, with, you you feel like he's angry because he's yelling. I don't see it that way. I see it as a way of telling his parents he loves them, but he's using words you might not use to express that. It's a great scene from that movie. And it's like Louis C.K. kind of took that scene and just like, I'm just going to extrapolate mm -hmm. that concept into an entire film. I mean, look, the character, the, the protagonist played by Joe List is, his family is messed up. I mean, they are messed up people. And um, there's some some really funny stuff with Joe List's interaction with um, the, is it a cousin who happens to be like, she's like half black or something? No, it was, it was a friend of his sister's. A friend of his sister's, that's right. She's there. And then there's just like the family. After a while, you're like, okay, I know the mom and dad. It's a lot of relations in this family. So it's this the, the 4th of July weekend kind of playing out with all this drama. And I will say this. I warmed up to it by the end. You know, it was a long time getting there. I was really like mm -hmm. the first half hour of this movie. I'm thinking like, where is this going? By the end, I kind of warmed up to it. And I think that this is, you know, this isn't groundbreaking. It's not going to change your life. It's, you know, a less, it's, it's not it's not a comedy uh it is but there are comedic moments that are all on the level of just being totally awkward uh it was okay does it get a resounding endorsement for me i, I would say probably not you know but i will say we're just one of the few outlets i guess that's going to talk about this movie does you is there a review on the film threat website yet no no i just saw it yesterday so i'll probably get one later out this today weekend. Yeah. Great this weekend or so, the weekend, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I felt like. What are your thoughts, Alan? I, it's, I had seen this story before. You know, it's the, you know, this is a guy going home after being away for a while, and all the family dysfunction coming out. I've I've seen it before, and so what you're looking for in movies like this is some moment that's going to say, "Hey, this is the reason you need to see this movie." And quite frankly, I don't have that reason. I don't have a a compelling reason to say you need to see this movie because of this. Um, I think it's interesting. The ending is very interesting, uh, the, how it played out with his parents. But, but again, uh, you know, we've seen this, this way too many times and, uh, and you're just looking for some insight into the specific family. Um, but, and it's not there. You're just seeing, uh, essentially a wind up. You, you put a room, a, fill a room with wind up dolls, set them off and you see where they go. And in this case, it goes in some interesting directions, but 
all right, they're they're done now, and and we move on. So yeah, it's a very mediocre movie in the end. I I wouldn't say mediocre. I just think it's just okay. You know, yeah. I mean, if I ha if I was forced to give a number rating for this, probably a five out of ten. You know, but yeah. what I think is interesting about it is one, um, one is that Louis C.K. he's back. You know, two. Uh, I my guess is he's self releasing this movie because the company that reached out to us is. I've never heard of. I feel like it's like, I just like, hey, do you want to review this movie? We get just get people that approach us and say, hey, do yeah. you want like a link of to a screener of a movie to see the movie so you can cover it? That's mm -hmm. mostly how we see movies. Uh, Alan and I, as we get links, mostly if you're a filmmaker, filmmaker pro tip, uh, get yourself an account on Vimeo at Vimeo.com. I'm not like, you know, I have an account there, but I mostly use it to review to, to see movies. I don't use it. Um, and I, I just, I, I think it's the more, it's like a professional version of YouTube. You can also sell your movies on Vimeo. If, if you create, uh, if, if you make a documentary, you can just sell it on, on Vimeo or you make a mm -hmm. short, you can sell it on Vimeo. It really is the professional filmmakers, uh, video platform. So there you go. But yeah, uh, I probably rated a five out of 10 and yeah i mean i i, I give it up. a i give it a six out of ten only in the sense of there's nothing really fundamentally wrong with the movie um but again i i don't have a compelling reason to say you need to see this movie you yeah. know but it's like it's but i will say this is that what slc punk did was it did that what the theme of this movie is it did it better in one scene in one scene and you can find there are isolated people have uploaded just that scene because it's so powerful it's matthew lillard talking to his mom and dad and he's basically telling telling them he loves them but he's not using the word love if you hear what i'm saying uh i'm not going to say it because my understanding is that uh people are listening to this regan and liam and i don't want to i don't want to say naughty <laughs> words i don't know if reagan and liam are still listening so I wanna, I wanna be, I, I wanna be careful today. So there we go. Let's go to your comments in the chat here. Jade Scott for five says, "Do you guys have annual passes for Universal? If not, uh, if not, I want to hook you up for all the work you guys do. I have a lot of employee passes available." Uh. Jade Scott, you can reach me. You can reach <laughs> me. Don't worry about Alan. Alan goes to free stuff all the time. He went to he goes to events and doesn't tell me about it because he knows I want to go. This is a true thing. <laughs> it's a huge conflict with Absolutely. Alan when I behind the scenes is Alan gets invited to stuff and then I find out later on his Instagram that like how'd you get oh well film threat was invited I just went to this thing. <laughs> Alan, Alan, okay. Um, so contact us at filmthreat.com/contact. Address it to me and I'll uh, I would love that. I would love that. I would go this weekend. If it, I'll, I'll, if, I'll if it wasn't such a pain to get to, I would be no, going to Universal more often. Well, there you go. Let's get back yeah. to these comments. And thank you for that, Jade Scott. SLC Punk is great, says John Long, last name. Love that movie. Holds up to today. Shane Mackey, comedian, my friend from Atlanta, says, I prefer comedian CK to auteur CK. I would agree. I mean, if you go to louisck.com, you can get his latest comedy special for five bucks. Just get it for five bucks. I think you can buy all of his comedy specials for like 20 bucks. I don't know. Like Louis C.K. to me is interesting in the sense that he was canceled. He kind of went away. He's done some, he's done stand up since. And he's just like, all right, it's, no one's going to hire me. I'll just do it myself. So now he's released this movie. Uh, 4th of July, he's released comedy specials. Whatever you think of that, I feel like he is truly an independent creator. Drummer, dude, 2112 says, hey, fellas, wanted to wish you two a happy 4th of July weekend. Thanks for all you do for all the things in film. By the way, we will never forgive Disney and company for their treatment of Star Wars. Is Indiana Jones next? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Indiana Jones is next. But this trial, we really want to do this right. We're building up. We're going to create a schedule. We're going to go through each charge. It's going to be a weekly show. It's going to, unfortunately, it's probably going to take us three, four months to get through all the charges. We're going to have uh, court sketch artists. This is going to be a thing that um, we hope builds 
uh, helps us build an audience for the other shows that we do. And we hope you'll be along for the ride. Thank you that for that drummer dude 2112. Is that drummer dude 2112? Is that a reference to Rush? Is that a reference to Rush? Let me know. Internet Rec Room. Now that you mention it, Louie, the show does remind me of a Woody Allen production. It's totally Woody Allen. Um, Freedom Punk says SLC Punk is brilliant. I agree with you. Uh, Zax says share this out from the YouTube share option. It helps the algorithm. Do it now. The show deserves to get to 500. We're trying to get to five, uh, 50,000 subs. So Oteo, which I believe I follow or have interacted with you on Twitter. Thank you for your comment here. I love this channel. Well, thank you for that. Louis' show was great, says Jack D. Mm -hmm. Ripper. Sean Zamir says, premiering in an old adult theater? Wait, is it? So I know that- What, the like, Lemley? I looked it up. Fourth of July is playing at the Lemley Monica Film Center. That's the Lemley on the west side of LA, um, if you want to see it in a theater. I mean, I would go just to get the ticket stub as a collector's item. I think that would be well worth it. Hey, Random Channel for 10 says, watch the boys episode seven and both Stranger Things episodes last night. Was up till 5 a.m., lol, and after recording <laughs> two podcasts today for my pod, Studio 22, love y'all. Stranger Things was epic. I'm hearing that. I have not watched season four. You know, there's only so much. I try to balance my viewing of things to your mainstream movies opening in theaters because I think it's important we talk about those and indie movies you'll, you've never heard of. And we're going to talk about one of those shortly. Um, in fact, you may have never even heard of 4th of July from Louis C.K. Um, but Random Channel, Random Channel, if Random Channel is covering those, we're not, you know, we did cover um, the boys. Maybe we'll do like a boys wrap up. Go to Random Channel's channel. Subscribe to Random Channel. Subscribe to Random Channel. And cocaine is a hell of a drug, says Alan is very talented. Oh. I, I am. You oh, have yes. no idea yeah. how talented Alan is. Check this out. This Alan did this for his TikTok. There we go, good. Alan. One take. One take. One take. That's why they call you one take Alan. Uh, thank you for all your comments. Smash that like bucket. Like, like the like bucket. The like, dude, I, <laughs> I, I'm only on two cups of coffee. I need more. I need more. Um, we're going to get to more of your comments and questions. What is upcoming? We're going to talk about the movie Poser. You saw this movie, Alan? I have not seen this movie. Oh, well then I'll talk about it. A um, yeah. couple quick comments before we pivot Internet Rec Room, my new favorite video. Alan, we love you. So love Sean, you Alan is, Alan is just starring all the comments that say nice thing, nice things <laughs> about Alan. Michael Seagriff, the like bucket, yeah, smash that like bucket. Uh, Hank VP says Chris unbreaded gore greater than G four gore. All right, there you go. I'm unbreaded. I like to think I'm unfiltered on our. On our and, and then Chris Gore 2022 quote like the like bucket says Dempsey. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Sean Zamir for 199. How inauthentic are trailer reactions? We don't do a lot of trailer reactions. I mean, there's some movies, there's some movies I wanted to do trailer reactions to just because you know I really want you to know about the trailer. There's a trailer. You can look this up. We don't, we're not going to do a trailer reaction to it. I think the thing is, is that people feel obligated to react like, and it just seems fake. Like some young TikToker um, faking an illness on, on, on their videos to get attention. So I don't really believe them. I think you can talk about the content of it, a trailer reaction, when you see people kind of trying to like, they're actually, tr they're, they're very aware that they're on camera and I can't, I find those irritating. Um, but yeah. I like to. Well, also when you, when you like go frame by frame and start picking things out, like a, like maybe they use an Ikea chair or, or an actor's teeth is really bad. You know, it gets, it just becomes toxic after that point. And you, you could ruin a movie from just uh, finding little nitpicks about, about the trailer. 
All right, are you talking about the IKEA chairs that they used <laughs> in Obi Wan? <laughs> Am I? I don't know. Hey, I'm going to refresh your memory for a second. This is Star Wars. Your expectations are much higher. You're on a you're on a ship. You're not going to be on chairs that wiggle like a waiting room of a dentist's office. Let me just let's let's revisit this. <laughs> Why would a chair on a starship wiggle like that? <laughs> ah. Anyways, Sean Zamir, thank you for the $199. <laughs> uh, Jack D. Ripper says, I'm here for Alan's nips and Alan's nips only. You'll get before the end of the show. I promise well, Not you. the first time I heard that. More nips. Luther Talbert says, Hello, yes, my kids are listening. Mrs. Talbert is messaging while Luther drives. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Thanks for the five dollars there. We're just, I don't know how old your kids are, what you're like. <laughs> I don't think my parents cared so much about language north of a certain age. Yeah. They didn't care. It was more about uh, adult things that could be considered more adult content. But uh Luther, thank you for that. We yeah. appreciate it. We hope you have a great Fourth of July weekend. I hope your destiny you reach your destination safely, and I hope you're going to have a great time. And I hope you know what. Here's what I also hope. I hope you're not on your phone. Have a good time. Play outdoor games. Horseshoes. I hope. I hope you enjoy fireworks where you're going. I'll be watching the fireworks in Pasadena. I cannot wait. They're doing a thing called. I think it's called America Fest. And it's at the Rose Bowl. And it's just the sort of like the, the parking lot and the sort of like lawn area of the Rose Bowl. It's very huge. It's huge. It's bigger than the Rose Bowl itself. And you go there and it's free. You bring yourself a blanket. You know, maybe you hide some adult beverages in a cinch bag, which I always do. Um, and you have yourself a good time. And I'm going to see the fireworks at America Fest on Monday so uh, do things with your kids that involve not being on a phone. Maybe catch yourself a movie. Might I recommend Minions? Uh, also recommend, if you're able to, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, although I mm -hmm. believe that's opening wide later. Uh, let's finish up with some more chat questions here. I'm going to do a quick review of another indie movie in theaters. H. Muller says, watched Maverick last week. Haven't been to the big screen since 2018. And oh my word, that's what movies used to feel like in the 90s and 2000s. That's why we go to the movies to escape. Mm -hmm. H. Muller. Absolutely. Great, great comment. And Aid Robertson says, for 449 pounds, says, have a great 4th of July weekend. And I love that you paid us in pounds. Yeah, you too. You have a great 4th of July. Yeah, you have a great 4th of July <laughs> yeah, weekend. Because I think I think you guys were involved in that too. So uh we wouldn't we wouldn't be celebrating 4th of July without if it were, the Brits. Without the and British. We appreciate yeah. that. Uh, let's, let's pivot for a moment here. We're going to talk about another movie that I'm going to guarantee you've never heard of. <laughs> never heard of this movie. Never heard of it. What's up? No, that's not it. That's not it. That's oh, it. Oh, Poser. Okay. Sorry. I was thinking of the other one. Oh, oh, Phantom of the Open. We're going to have to go quick here, but Poser, yeah. uh, th this is quick review of this movie Poser, which is about, this woman who at the beginning of the movie sort of like she's this sort of like quiet shy girl who interviews musicians and i love um the interview the in, she, her interviewing musicians is kind of weird and poser is about truly a woman who tries to be a poser the first thing that she looks up is how to start a podcast and then she starts a podcast she's interviewing musicians and then you see what she does is she interviews musicians on her phone then she takes the audio and sets it to a cassette tape because she likes the cassette tape sound and then releases her podcast after it's been transferred to cassette tape to process the audio, which I think is really interesting. And she's kind of a girl that's kind of shy. And the way she kind of opens up is by talking to, you know, small indie bands. I think it's in, is it Columbus, Ohio? I think it takes place in Columbus, Ohio. And the lead actress of this is phenomenal. Uh, what's her name? Sylvie Mix. And then there's another. Uh, uh, so Sylvie Sylvie Mix. She plays this character named Lennon, who starts this podcast. And it's interesting because the name of the bands are like a f 
fish fish forks or like it's just really weird i know that's not it exactly but the band names are just just bizarre right uh you can tell they're completely indie band names and she ends up meeting this woman named bobby kitten who's in this duo with a guy who wears a wolf mask and kind of becomes obsessed with her and her career and in a way kind of starts to stalk her what I love about this movie is the tone of it. First of all, I think the music in the film is really great. The tone is great. It's very purposeful. Um, it's funny, but not in a haha funny way. It's like the situations are funny. The bands are funny. The, the lead actress and her chemistry with this woman, Bobby Kitten, who I guess is her real name in real life is Bobby Kitten. And then she's the actress named the character's name Bobby Kitten and the actress's name is Bobby Kitten. I'm assuming she's a musician because she performs in the movie. And it's kind of about how this podcaster stalks this band. And I don't want to ruin anything that happens, but it's like part, part awkward comedy, part thriller, and incredibly well made. It's like a beautiful movie. Like and, and I, I recommend it. It's playing actually in theaters. It, we in, in fact, we sponsored a screening a couple weeks ago where you could see the movie for free, but it's actually playing at the Frida Cinema in Santa Ana. In fact, um, Alan and I are talking about doing a monthly screening series at the Frida Cinema that we will host, and we'll let, let you know details about that. Mm -hmm. But Poser is just... It's... It's just one of those movies that I also like the small nature of it. It's this woman who who becomes obsessed with being an artist and 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 isn't sort of channels their creativity for her own use. I don't want to ruin it because there's just dramatic things that happen in the in the sort of right in the middle of the film that set off stuff that would ruin the movie, except that, I recommend it also because this is a movie that, um, God, I just really love the way it was shot yeah. and the way it looks and also this, the music and just the someone like sort of revealing like, well, here's a way to do a podcast. I never thought the I thought of the idea of like recording someone digitally and then filtering it through a cassette tape. I think that that was kind of neat, but strongly recommend this movie. I know there's going to be a review on the Film Threat website shortly, Alan. I know we have a screener there. Because I watched okay. it, definitely assign that one to someone. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, looking at pictures from the film, it, you know, there's a dark tone to it. Does this movie yeah, get oh, yeah. dark or? Yeah, like. Yeah, but it, it's weird. See, it's like that thing of like. Here's the thing. Like, when when I first heard that a thing called salted caramel existed, I thought that sounds disgusting. Salted caramel? What is that? You're putting salt on caramel, and then you try it, and it's delicious. When you think of combinations of foods that shouldn't go well together, and then you think, oh my God, that's amazing. Peanut butter, banana sandwich. Now I want one now that I've said those words out loud. So Poser is like that in the sense that, you know, it has this very sort of serious tone, but underneath some of it is very funny just from the situations and things people are saying. And then it also, um, I will say there is a dark turn that the movie takes. And I don't mm -hmm. want to. I don't want to go into detail about what it is, except yeah. that I strongly recommend it. Um, I did see it as a screener. I would have preferred to have seen this in a theater. Um, in fact, maybe it's something that, like, yeah. I, it, look, if it's if it's playing in a theater closer to me, something I would go see. Or the Frida's Frida's not that bad. It's about thirty minutes from me. Um, it's at, in Santa Ana, California. You can look up the Frida Cinema. But really enjoyed this movie. Can't recommend it enough. Uh, and we're going to have a review on the Film Threat website. Before our special guest joins us here, we have a special guest joining us at 1030. I, I want to... Wait, that's not right. Thank you for that flaccid phoenix. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk about this movie that Alan saw, which I yeah. have seen, called Phantom of the Open. Let me let me get that set up there. Um, yeah. And this is, I think it's part of our purpose for existing film thread existing that we let you know about movies you wouldn't know about if you didn't listen to this show, it, which instantly makes you smarter than most people. This is like, this is like when the wizard gave the scarecrow the diploma and he was instantly smart by listening and or watching to watching the show, you're instantly smarter than everybody else. 
just for knowing that movies other than Thor, Love and Thunder, or Minions exist. But Alan, tell us about Phantom of the o uh, Phantom of the Open. Yeah, well, this is uh, this is one of those indie films with big stars in it. It stars Mark Rylance as uh, Maurice F uh, Flitcroft. It's the real. It's the true story of Maurice. Uh, it also has Sally Hawkins who plays his wife. But the the general idea is, um, for some reason, uh, the Brits love to celebrate mediocre athletes, and just like Eddie the Eagle, we have Maurice Flitcroft here. He's a guy, a lower class guy who works on the docks. Uh, he's in fear of losing his job because of the economy tanking. Uh, so he decides that he's, uh, you know, he's going to take up golf. He just one day sees golf on television and says, oh, I can do this. And um, through kind of uh, not checking or checking a certain box on the British Open application, he is accepted as, uh, as a participant, as a contestant in the British Open on television. And um, so as he's playing, having never played the game before, he goes up and just plays and plays horribly. And, uh, <laughs> and this starts to get the attention of the organizers of the British Open. They wonder how this guy got in. And, um, and, you know, they're kind of stuck at this point and they have to let him finish the first round, which of course he loses and, and doesn't return for the next day. Um, but then uh, Maurice is so inspired by wanting to play golf for the rest of his life. I, the rest of the movie is basically his attempts to get back into the British Open to the point where he actually um, he actually uh, dons a disguise, changes his name and, and enters in as a different person, as a as a person who was already registered in, but couldn't uh, couldn't show up. So he took his place. Um, and so it has a very much a, a the Eddie the Eagle vibe. It definitely has. It, it's a less. Uh, it's a more serious version of Happy Gilmore uh, in, in, in that sense. Uh, he, it's true he's not very good at golf. They, they kind of hold to that throughout the film. But uh, ultimately, it's, it's, a, it's a movie about his family, about just his need to, you know, he's a guy who's been always supporting his family, his, you know, giving his wife children. Um, he has a twin sons who are, who, quite frankly, were, were champion disco dancers. Uh, and he supported them that. So he spent his life just supporting his family and going into golf was his family's way of paying it back to him and saying, you know, we believe in you, pursue your dream of golf. And so it's a very, just a very sweet story about a guy who's just no good. Uh, a sweet story about a bad athlete. Is is it based on a true story? Yes, it's absolutely a true story. In fact, um, the guy is so inspiring that uh, near the end, you find out that the University of Michigan uh, created an award for the worst player on the team, and uh, and named it after Maurice Flitcroft. And they, you know, it was it was just kind of I guess ultimately it's a story of finding meaning in one's life. And and even though this guy couldn't play golf at all, uh, he he made an impact on the world. And I think that's that's essentially why they made the movie. I'm pretty sure. First of all, I love that kind of story. I love the story mm -hmm. of just like someone who fails at something, but keeps going in spite of failure. I think that that is a, if there's, if there's a lesson to be learned in, in just how to cope in life is mm -hmm. failure is part of life. Allowing yourself just as someone who was, uh, I, I think, I think in some respects I could be, could have been considered a tough dad. Right. And it's just mm -hmm. part of what you have to do is you have to let your kids fail at something in order for them to level up. I mean, that's how you beat, I tell you, that's the lesson of every video game you've ever played. The lesson mm -hmm. is you continue to fail until you learn how to not fail. Um, and and I, I love that kind of story. I find yeah. them I find them almost more inspiring than stories where characters win. Mm -hmm. For example, whenever you ask anyone, hey, who won the fight in the first Rocky movie? Well, everybody says, well, Rocky. No, that's not what happened. In the first Rocky movie, Rocky loses. But he earns the thing that is more important than winning the fight in the first Rocky movie against Apollo Creed, he earns respect. And he was someone who was a loser, this sort of like low level thug who boxed and didn't take it super seriously and, and then earned respect mm -hmm. from the community, from the world of sports. And it didn't matter that he lost the fight. And then basically Rocky II is a remake of Rocky I where Rocky Wait. wins. <laughs> Sorry for the spoiler, um, but but I love lessons like that, in particular, yeah. 
true lessons. I'd love to see a documentary about this person just because when I see movies like this and I see like, oh, this is the biopic, in some ways I'd almost rather like kind of rather watch the documentary about this person's life rather than the movie. But how is Mark Rylance? Because I love Mark oh, Rylance. Yes. He, what I love about Mark Rylance, he's the kind of actor that you're like, you say to yourself, is that Mark Rylance? Because he's so like, I mean, his eyebrows look different in this than other roles yeah. he's played. And he's got the teeth going on too. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, like I said, I do, I do improv and I always start a scene in character and it obviously, it always evolves into me. Um, you know, Mark Rylance definitely creates a character with, uh, with Maurice here. And um, so, yeah, he's great. And he, you know, what actors do is they understand their character, they build the character and they keep that character consistent, um, especially as that character arc goes on. And, uh, you know, Sally Hawkins plays, plays his wife. She plays a very dutiful wife uh, and she has her moments too. Um, you know, great actors playing regular roles. Uh, and they always hit it out of the park. And, and to your point, I you know I always say adversity builds character. You know you cannot go through life having everything go your way. You know things have things bad have to happen in your life in order for you to grow as a human being. And I, I think that's that's a message I, I swear we've lost on the world today, especially in raising kids. It it hundred percent is a message that's been lost that that adversity and overcoming adversity. Mm -hmm. Every successful person that you know or that you're aware of failed a lot. Walt Disney, for example, filed for bankruptcy seven times. You mm -hmm. can look this up. He filed for bankruptcy seven times before Disneyland even opened. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a, that's a guy that like, you know, whatever you think of Walt Disney failed a lot. And when he made Snow White, they thought he was crazy. They thought, that Walt Disney was crazy. No one wants to see a movie, a cartoon more than five minutes. Yeah. You're nuts. They called it Disney's folly is what they called Snow White. And now here we are enjoying feature length yeah. animated well, movies. Um, interesting story about, interesting story about Snow White. He was a million dollars away from completing the film. He didn't have the money. And so what he did, and this is kind of weird, but he took the film to the bank showed the banker the film and uh, and after seeing the film the, the banker said okay right, you have a great film here here's the money i mean that's kind of how lucky the guy was and and if you look at walt disney's life every single project he worked on if it failed it was going to sink the company and and so he was motivated by success which is a far cry from where disney is right now well disney is motivated by fear and um mm -hmm. i think um too easily manipulated by the mob and what a small yeah. percentage of their customers think a small. Yeah. So they're catering to a smaller group rather than I recently, I tweeted yesterday on my personal Twitter account at that Chris Gore. All I said was the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, mm -hmm. which is a quote from a book, but also a quote from Star Trek to the wrath of Khan. Yeah. And so uh, I mean, one of isn't that one of Spock's yeah. dying words? The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Yeah, and he says that it, that you know, was his motivation to save, you know, to jettison the Genesis project. And you know, we've lost that. So yeah, yeah. yeah I will uh, say, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Maybe no, go ahead. Start. No, go ahead. We're going to go to some no. comments before our special guest is be joining us momentarily. But we're going to get to some of your chat comments and questions as we reset here so let me get to that we're gonna we're just gonna switch we're gonna switch real quickly let's go to the comments here we've got a bunch of comments uh rest rust in peace says knowledge is the beginning of wisdom absolutely mm -hmm. jack d ripper fall forward shelby ac ed wood exclamation point brilliant film with that kind of the next one will be better mantra <laughs> love it. I love Johnny Depp in that movie too. Jack D. Ripper, Ed Wood, my fave Burton film. Sean Zamir, we'll check it out now. Thanks for the tip, Alan. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the tip. Uh, Michael Seagraf says, I've seen the trailer for this. I might give it a shot. Is that a, give it a shot. Is that a, uh, is that a joke? A golf pun. Is that a, a golf a pun. Double entendre there. Scott Slaughterbeck for five says, where else would we ever hear of these obscure films? That's partly why 
you're watching this channel, one would assume. MM for five says, at this point, I'm expecting Chris to have an episode like the jerk. He hates that chair. Stay away from the chair. <laughs> Okay. Oteo says, nothing like listening to some awesome opinions to start the weekend. I often take out a pen to mark the movies named here. It's honestly how great, how great, how many, it's honestly great how many different movies are found here. Well, thank you. That's, look, we're going to cover the mainstream stuff, but it's really important that you diversify your media mm -hmm. diet. And this is why, like, I see a lot of people that I watch, you know, are disheart disheartened and disenchanted with current mainstream Hollywood. And I say, I feel for you because I'm with you, right? Like I, I agree, but if you only watch Marvel, Pixar, Disney, Star Wars, mainstream, whatever, I feel like that's just not a way to go. It's sort of like having fast food for every meal. You can't do that. You've got to feast on something that is, that, that can make you think that can make you, you know, just diversify your media diet. I think it's very important. And Flaccid Phoenix says, Share out the stream, subscribe to the Film Threat YouTube channel. We are less than 100 subs away from 45,000. We've got over 350 people watching with us live, and we thank you for that. Now, let me bring on my friend. My friend for <laughs> over, oh my God, 96? Since 96? I've been friends with Dan Mervish. Dan Mervish, if you don't know who he is, is a legend he is a legend in indie cinema who has written, produced, directed numerous indie indie films. Look up Dan Mervish on on uh, look him up, look him up on on IMDb. Uh, Open House is a real estate musical you may have heard of that he made. He also did a movie called Omaha the Movie, uh, along with this new film that I actually saw in the theaters. Uh, it was playing at the, it was in Glendale, it was at the Glendale Lemley or New Art, uh, 18 and a half. Dan Mervish is joining us on the show today to tell us all about his new film. Dan, my friend, so good to see you. How you doing? I'm doing great, Chris. Great to see you and our other good friend, Alan. Yeah. Hey, Alan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. I haven't known as long as Chris, but... <laughs> That's okay. Um, Dan, tell people about, and first of all, I want to get into some of your other movies, but 18 and a half is, I know it's coming out digital soon. Um, it's the, in a, it's theatrical run at the moment. What is the story of 18 and a half? So the story is, it is about a young woman, young 25 year old woman working in the white, in the Nixon white house in 1974. And she uh, gets a hold of the missing 18 and a half minute gap in the Nixon Watergate tapes and tries to leak it to a reporter. And then they run afoul of hippies, swingers and nefarious people out to get them. That's who would not, who would not want to see a movie like that? <laughs> exactly. And I've seen the movie. It's, it's, I mean, there are really serious aspects to it. And if you don't know anything about the Nixon tapes, you don't need to. The movie explains it very well. The movie puts it into context. Um, it is a period piece, which is amazing. Um, the way that you just got this 1974, like all the hairstyles, even the way people interact with each other, very, very early 70s. So, you know, having come from that era, I totally relate to it. And it's shot all at this, like it takes place mostly at this one location in a motel, uh, which is very from the period. Uh, it, and it's also uh, for the serious subject matter, something of a comedy. I will say there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of comedy in this and just sort of the over the topness and the ridiculousness of this. Now, this is also a movie that, um, cause you and I were chatting while you were making the movie. The, the pandemic like just like happened. So you were in the middle of making this movie, which you financed through a crowdfund. I want to ask you about that. Um, and then, and then like you had to finish the movie li later. Can you tell us about, about that? It's a, it's an interesting story. Yeah. So we started shooting uh, March 3rd, uh, 2020. What could possibly go wrong in March of 2020? And uh, we got about 11 days in and we actually heard from the DGA rep that, Oh, because uh, we were so isolated. We were shooting in um, on the tip of Long Island, uh, outside like three hours outside of New York City um, and kind of in our own bubble we were kind of doing a lot of things right anyway and then we found out that we were one of the last films shooting in North America and I was like wait what what does everyone else know that we don't know what's coming so we uh, like everyone else we shut down 
uh, with 11 days in the can and we had, which was about, you know, 75, 80% in the movie. We had four days left to shoot. Uh, so I grabbed a hard drive, came back to LA, started editing the movie, but a third of our crew. So about seven or eight of them, kind of the Brooklyn, you know, single types, uh, they just stayed at this place, the Silver Sands Motel, um, because it was empty and they were afraid to go back to New York. So about uh, seven or eight of them stayed for about 10 weeks. And our cinematographer, Elle Schneider, she stayed for six months. She just never left. And um, and anyway, and six months later, it was, you know, the DGA and SAG had come up with the protocols for, um, um, you know, to, to work safely uh, in COVID. And we were one of the first first films back shooting and we finished off our, our four weeks during that time but you know during that six months we got a lot of else done we we recorded our our voiceover performers um uh during that time because everyone had zoom by then they didn't have Streamyard; they had zoom and um and we were able to get a lot done and, and a lot of the music uh, got done during that time as well uh t tell me about like because this is the thing i've always admired about you a lot of filmmakers today are like, oh, I, I couldn't make my movie because of X excuse. You have never, in all my history of knowing you, nothing stops you. <laughs> no lack of money for lack of whatever. Your, your moxie is insane over the top. And I want to say, uh, uh, post your questions in the chat here. We're going to go to your chat questions after this, but I want to say, like, nothing stops you. It's like, Okay, like when you ask an indie filmmaker how much money you need to make your movie, the answer is how much do you have? How much do you right? have? Yep. How much do you have? That's it's like you've got five thousand. Okay, that's what we're making. That's your for. budget. Yeah, you fifty thousand. You're making it for that. How did you secure the funds? I knew you did a crowdfunding, and I'm on your newsletter list. Um, how did you raise the funding? I knew it was a crowdfund, but can you give some sort of bullet point? tips and then we're going to go to our chat questions here sure are yeah, loving did, chat, by the way yeah so we great. did um uh i've used kickstarter before on this one we use uh seed and spark um uh and you know i mean you can only really hope to raise five or ten percent of the budget through crowdfunding directly you know it's kickstarter not kick finisher or seed and spark not you know tree and forest or whatever so uh you know, but but it's a little bit of a I use it more like a Trojan horse because, you know, if your old bass player buddy from college, Dave, gives you forty dollars and then he posts the pitch video on his Facebook page. Well, his brother in law in Silicon Valley, who you've never met, you know, may invest ten thousand dollars, you know, and so that's so it really is kind of a, a spark. And what's nice about it is that's all cast agnostic financing, which means they don't care if you get a big name actor or tom cruise in your film they're doing it because they like you they like the project they like the story you know whatever and um and, and i think that's really key too because uh you know the thing i learned a long time ago from from robert altman was you know set a start date tell everyone trains leave in the station and you on board or or aren't you and um and and that by having that cast agnostic you know even little chunk of financing that's enough to give you the confidence and the moxie to say yeah we got a start date march 3rd 2020 ain't nothing stopping us you know so uh but then we also teamed up with a uh, 501c3 uh fiscal sponsor uh the film the filmmakers collaborative film collaborative um so a lot of people gave money that way which is great it's a good option to tell rich people hey you're not going to make your money anyway why don't you just donate it and get a write-off now so that's good but also it can last a lot longer than uh than you know a limited 30-day campaign in, in that way it's more like patreon or only fans you know i don't have to tell you about that and um and so you can kind of leave it up and, and keep raising money that way uh and and then there's some people who who just invest in the films um you know because it, it may be better for them that way so one way or the other we cobbled it together and um and started making the movie Let's go to the uh, chat uh, comments and questions. And I think we, we do have a special guest joining us. Oh, who's that? Dana, you want to come in? So this is my co-executive producer. He's been my producing partner on all my films. And uh, he is Dana Altman. I am in his office in Omaha, Nebraska right now because we have a screen oh, in wow. Omaha. And um, Dana is a fantastic producer, not just- Wait, you're, film, you're in Nebraska right now, Dan? I am in Nebraska right now. I know, what are the odds, right? <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, cool. Well, wave to Dana. Dana. 
Yeah, we're on. Maybe Dana's busy. Anyway, so Dana is also happens to be uh, the grandson of Robert Altman and has his amazing poster connection here. Here's Dana. There he is. Stick your head in. There he is right there. Hey, Dana. Pleasure to meet you. That's hey, Chris Gore. Nice to meet you, Chris. All right. I, I love your grandfather's films. Uh, I do, too. He, uh, <laughs> if I could just be so prolific and, and good at it, but I'm not. <laughs> uh well you know you get there you know you get there uh god robert altman i can't the the number of movies i mean oh my god the player probably one of my absolute favorites nashville i mean like you could go on and on. i don't even like country music yeah, i love great. nashville so um that's great anyways let's uh let's go to our comments and questions so here. the one who, who helps me make all the movies that we make here D well I'm glad finally the silent partner is exposed. So it's great to meet you, Dana. Uh, let's get some comments and questions here. Solomon Thornton says, love the concept of this film. I'm sold. Trailer looks cool. Love some Nixon Watergate stuff. Internet Rec Room says, and Bruce Campbell, super cool. Oh, man. Okay, yeah. Uh, Flaccid Phoenix says, Bruce Campbell as Nixon equals gold. I can confirm Bruce Campbell is amazing in this movie. Freedom Punk says, I will definitely be checking this flick out. Love me some Bruce Campbell. And the title, is there, like Jack D. Ripper asks, is there any Fellini-ness in this movie? Because the title is kind of a reference to Fellini's Eight and a Half. Is it? Or like, what did you think? Uh, I'll ask you, Chris, but uh, not so much. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a little bit like they, they're at a cease. Bye, Dana. Dana's, Take care, Dana's Dana. producing another film right Thank now, so he's got oh, yeah. to run. But um you know it, they both take place at a seaside motel and they both have weird people who show up um and but fellini was a smart guy he knew that if you start a, a title with a number it's always going to show up at the beginning of the alphabet so um <laughs> you know i so i i bow my hat to him there so uh but that those are the main references but no i mean it kind of betrays that my roots are as much in politics as they are in film that when I think when someone says 18 and a half to me, uh, I, the first thing in my mind is, is the Nixon tapes. So, uh, let's go to some more questions here. Internet rec room has a question for you based on a true story, revisionist vision. I don't know much about Watergate. So, uh, it is a good question. So there's a couple different ways to do historical fiction. There's the Tarantino method and I'm no academic, but you know, where he completely rewrites history. And by the end of the movie, everything is, you know, everything we know is completely different. Hitler lives or Manson dies or, you know, whatever that kind of thing. Then there's, um, you know, then there's the people that, that like Hugh entire, you know, just do like docudramas where you take real people and real things and then you change just one little thing and everyone complains about it. Um, what we've done is, is, and the approach I took with this is that, you know, without spoiling the end of the movie, by the end of the movie, history has, you know, we, we've created this little loop with fictional characters playing in a real world. But by the end of the movie, our timeline of history is pretty much reset to what we know which makes it plausible speculative historical fiction if that's a term i don't know um so but it is a good question so it, it is an original story that i came up with uh with myself and and my writing partner daniel moya who then wrote the the full screenplay and um and it was really based on this location we found my my buddy terry keith um and, and chris you may remember him from the olden days um mm -hmm. he he was an indie film producer but he's also just inherited this great motel out in uh on the tip of long island from his grandparents that was built in the 50s and 60s and then he took it over and being a savvy indie film guy you know he's run it as a ran it as a hotel for for 10 years but he also kept it very vintage there's no satellite dishes in front and he kept the neon sign always working so he gets a lot of fashion shoots there and uh, and music videos but then he said hey dan if you want to make a feature no one's ever shot here shot a feature here before we're closed in the winter everyone on the cast and crew can stay here i was like well when you get a location that good you make a movie it's so. so funny. It's so funny how much circumstances will, will dictate an indie movie. Like I've got a lake house. Could you make a horror movie here? Like that, that yeah. does <laughs> occur. Um, Freedom Punk asks, how much fun was it to work with Bruce Campbell? Bruce, it, yeah. I mean, come on. 
uh, he's Bruce Campbell. Uh, he's awesome. And, and, you know, people think of him as like an icon in, in the horror world, but he's really an, also an icon in the indie film world. I mean, the stories of him and, and we were working with Ted Ramey too, Sam's brother, uh, you know, and they would just tell us stories about, you know, putting together evil dead and evil dead Two, And, you know, just out of spitting and, and, and bubble gum, you know, back in, in the, in your old days in, in Detroit. So, um, so it was great. We had thought about working together on the last film and the schedule didn't work out for that. On this one, he was originally going to play a different character. He's going to play the character that, uh, Vondi Curtis Hall winds up playing. Uh, but then he'd had some surgery and that, that didn't work out. Uh, but then I said, how about doing the voice of Nixon? And it turned out that he was a huge aficionado of Nixon and Watergate when he was 14 in, in Detroit growing up. He spent the summer, instead of playing baseball outside, he was glued to the television just watching the Watergate um, Senate hearings. And so, and he and Ted had done some kind of Watergate comedy sketches before where actually Ted was Nixon and Bruce was Haldeman. So, um, so it was, it, you know, he knew this world well and, uh, and, and was happy to do it. And, and, you know, and in general, I wanted someone that could not just do a Nixon impersonation because you can still get rich little, you know, who's still alive to do that. But I wanted someone that, that could really bring his own, you know, sense of gravitas and humor and irony and, and performance to, to the role. And, and Bruce really does that. Uh, another comment here from Oteo, uh, plausible speculative sounds like a good movie name. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, <laughs> uh, Michael Seagrass, this film will open in theaters. It's actually, I saw it in theaters a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Is it still doing its theatrical run? And when it is, it yeah. We've, we've had a 60 city theatrical run around the country. Um, and we're kind of at the tail end of that. Uh, it's playing in Omaha starting tonight, uh, for two weeks. Omaha's where I'm from, so the there's and a lot of our backers and cast and crew were kind of from here. Omaha Steaks was a sponsor in the film. I don't know if you noticed the product placement in there, but it's in there. Um, <laughs> uh, but then it's uh, and it's going to keep playing in a few other theaters uh, in West Virginia, in Wichita next week, in Orlando next week. Um, it's still playing in Chicago at the Wilmette Theater um, sporadically over the next few weeks, um, and then and then starting next. Uh, what is it, Tuesday, July 5th, the VOD and digital release comes out in the U.S. and Canada. And then July 11th, uh, the VOD and digital comes out in the U.K. and Ireland. Cool. Uh, another question here, Michael Seagraf. How many pairs of bell bottoms did the costume designer have to come up with? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> Not that many bell bottoms because it, it's interesting because 74 is a very specific you know, time. I mean, I guess there are bell bottoms, but there were, um, you know, but it was before disco, but kind of post hippie era, but we had an amazing costume designer, Sarah Kogan, who, who would, she collects old period, um, patterns, paper patterns. And so she would be up 24 hours at night, just sewing new costumes from these old patterns. And, and so we get some, some really amazing sort of period appropriate costumes that fit the actors. Cool. Uh, another question here, Jack D. Ripper, favorite 70s political thriller? Um, Three Days of the Condor, yeah. uh, Clute, um, The Conversation, all of those, you know, all the President's Men, obviously, but uh, for other reasons. But um, but yeah, I mean, this I always kind of pitched this early on as Three Days of the Condor meets Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, but a little funnier than either of those. And, you know, maybe we got that. I don't know. It, it's definitely funny and has its serious moments. So there you go. Sean Jamir, how long did it take to write, Dan? It, that took a while. It took, uh, I mean, largely because I wasn't paying my writer. So <laughs> <laughs> so he had other things come up. Um, but we took our time with it. You know, we wanted to get it right. So it was like two years, you know, from when we first kind of had the, the, the beginnings of the idea. Two and a half years, maybe. Um, it, it, it definitely, we took our time with it because, you know, look, you can... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of, th you know, the shooting should happen fast on an indie film, but the writing, you have the luxury, you know, you should have the luxury to take your time and, and get it right. And this is a, it's an intricate plot. So there's a lot of pieces that we had to kind of try to get right. And hopefully we got some of them right. Cool. Masters so of the had nothing to do with the, uh, <laughs> I was gonna say, it had nothing to do with the 50th anniversary of the break in then. Well, that I mean, that worked out nicely. So, yeah, a week ago <laughs> was the 50th anniversary of the Watergate uh, break-in. Yeah, because you opened, you opened pretty close to that. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that was on that was on purpose. I mean, once we realized that that was coming around the corner, you know, the distributors that we work with, um, uh, they they definitely noticed that. And uh, well, I told them about it. And so they, you know, and it was a great way to get extra press. You know, people are doing lists of all the Watergate films. I'm surprised no one's done a list called Dick Picks, Nixon in film. You know, um, Chris, if you want to put that together it's all yours there is, is there a movie called dick there is a movie called there dick. Is a, yeah yeah which is a great movie you know um so yeah i mean there's a great body of work in, including altman's um uh, uh film secret honor you know which was great um but uh but we also we started playing at film festivals in the fall so the film was already played at 21 festivals on on eight continents on uh, no four, uh, four continents eight countries and um so we had a really good run with it at, at film festivals and we tried to go from mostly live ones um and then you know and then we kind of took our time but honestly people weren't coming to theaters before so we're like let's just wait till this 50th anniversary and hopefully people will start to be coming to theaters now um and and so far so good yeah. Masters of the Nerddom asks, was it difficult to film a period piece based in the 70s? How much creativity goes into planning for a film like this? Yeah, you know, the, the key thing is location, location, location. It, it, if you've got period locations, because in addition to the motel, my writing partner, Daniel, just coincidentally, his aunt uh, worked at a diner that was just down the street from the motel that was also a period looking diner. So once you have that, and, and what was great about the motel too, is he had a lot of stuff. He had couches and chairs and TVs and a spiral staircase, things like that, um, which we could move around. We had a great production designer, Monica Dabrowski. And, and so she spent a lot of time moving things around. And then the key thing was we bought a lot of, uh, we bought like four reel to reel players on eBay uh, which were still working, uh, which is pretty amazing. And they weren't that expensive. Uh, and a couple of IBM Selectrics too. So once you get a couple of those key props in, and then as I say, the costumes, it's it's a lot easier than you think, or a lot less daunting, I guess. Uh, um, you know, on my last film, Bernard and Huey, about 10% of that was set in like 1988. And we shot you know, we shot like a whole 1988 New York subway scene in my garage in Culver City, you know, and that kind of taught me like, OK, don't be afraid of period. You know, if you're an indie filmmaker, like if you're smart about it or reasonably smart, you can you can pull it off. And not just that, I think uh, the cars really sell it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The we have a, a really Dodge Dart swinger in the film. I, lo I love that. I love the Dodge Dart. When I saw that at, near the beginning of the movie, I'm like, I'm sold. I'm sold. <laughs> I, I had a girlfriend in high school who had a Dodge Dart. I'm and, just impressed uh, you had a girlfriend in high school, Chris. Well, so, that, first of uh, all, everyone cool. should be surprised by that fact. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> another comment here from Scott Slaughterbeck. This is now on my list. 70s politics closed down motel Long Island. That's great. And then Solomon Thornton asks, as we're wrapping up, we're going to be wrapping up here real quick. Solomon Thornton asks, what is the best advice for a new filmmaker? Very well. No, actually, you've told this advice. You should get specific, Dan, because not everybody knows the... No, but no, seriously. I mean, you, you need some kind of a life partner or professional relationship or family that will help you, you know, not just financially, but just emotionally get through this stuff because it ain't easy. You know, we, I mean, we laugh about it. It's, it sounds fun to make a little indie movie, but it's not. It takes a lot of years. You know, you, you can take five years getting ready to shoot, you know, for... A week and a half and then there's a global pandemic and it's like you need some sort of emotional backstop to to make it through these things um so uh yeah that's that's the number one thing and then and just make friends because you're going to need them to help you in all kinds of ways you know so um and go to film festivals because that's where you meet friends because you've just lost a bunch of your friends because you just took a bunch of their money so you need new friends <laughs> but I, whatever i, I point out the serious side of this advice you're giving because it, no, I'm serious for a second, just for everybody listening. They think you're joking. Ha ha. I, I know your wife. Uh, I, met your, I know your kids. I've met your kids many times. Uh, and your wife is a doctor. She has, she has what one would describe as a solid career. She has yeah. a job and a career. And so what you mean by this is like, when you say marry well, just, you've got to have a partner, whether it's a, you know, a married partner or a partner in life or even a business partner, someone to support, not just financially, but also like getting through the times when you're not making money. And when you are making money, you know, I was fortunate enough 
uh, that, you know, I had a, a partner that supported me and then I could go off and do artisty things. I'm going to do this project, hope it makes money. And then fortunately you kind of learn that like making money, you know, that needs to be a part of the equation at least, or at least considered. And so it's important to have like that support system, you know, build your team, whether it's someone you're married to or not, but like, so just, there you go. Um, Michael Seagriff says, uh, that's exactly right. To think a filmmaker would answer some of silly questions boggles my mind. Um, make a Makadema says, film threat interviews are the movie version of the TV show inside the actor studio. The info film threat presents is priceless. Thank you for that. And then uh, Flaccid Phoenix asks, which shot in the movie was the most fun to shoot? Um, there's a couple of oneers, long oneers in there. There's one where there's where they're listening to the tape, where literally it's like a five minute shot, and everybody. What was great about it was everybody on the crew, and we didn't have a huge crew, but everyone was doing something. People were moving things around. People were moving the dolly, pushing the camera, doing the sound. There's my producers hidden, covered by a blanket and a TV, yelling out cues. Um, it was, and then when, you know, and it took like nine takes to get it right. But when we got it right, we were like, everyone was like, yeah, that's it. We nailed it. And I think that's great because it really reinforced that film is a collaborative art form. The actors are doing their thing. Everyone's working together. And, and when it does come together, like a perfect plan, like in the 18, you know, you, you can, you can really embrace and, and, and celebrate it. And, um, uh, yeah, so that was good. Um, you know, the other thing, uh, by the way, just to kind of throw in here some relevance to this whole thing is that, uh, and, and Alan asked about the timeliness of the 50th anniversary of Watergate, but also the January 6th hearings that are going on now. Like just the other day, there was the whole Cassidy Hutchinson, you know, revelations. And, and thematically, that is very similar to our film, which is about a 25-year-old White House young you know, low level woman working there who has the power to bring down a president and the courage to do it. And I was like, oh, my God, this is like our, our tagline come alive here. Um, so even though it's Watergate and you may not know anything about Watergate, like thematic and as Chris said, you don't really need to know anything about Watergate. Thematically, there's a lot of relevance and salience to, to the film now, I think. And wrapping up with a final comment here, Jack D. Ripper. Hey, Dan, have you seen RRR? Chris won't stop talking about it. I have not seen it, but I do know that Chris has not stopped talking about it. I, know, <laughs> I, listen, to, I listen to Chris and Alan all the time. It's so funny. Dan Dan tells me, because he'll text me, and he'll, like, you go on these walks, and you listen yeah. to the show, because Film Threat, it's actually on Spotify also, the, the mm -hmm. Film Threat podcast, live cast, whatever we're calling it. As is so, our soundtrack, by the way. Our soundtrack just hit Spotify. Oh my God. Ooh. That's all. I love it. I love how easy it is. Like, um, I'm, I am a Spotify guy. I'm not whatever you think of it. Fine. But I get my movie soundtracks in there and I'm doing attack of the doc. We're actually doing a soundtrack to the documentary, which will probably think I'd be out before the end of the year. It's an easy way to release. It used to be a pain in the ass to release movie soundtracks. Now you can just do it independently. So what are you looking for, Dan? I'm looking for, I am looking for something. I, we have some vinyl discs of the, oh, that's right. part oh, of the sweet. soundtrack. Oh, here they are, here they are. So yeah, so if you come to a live screening, this is why you gotta show up wherever I am, is we have some of these for sale. This is because it's, there's like a year backlog getting full 12 inch vinyl, but we got these oh, flexi wow. discs. Oh, those are the ones that would available. sometimes come in like Mad Magazine. Exactly. Although these yeah. were made in the Czech Republic, strangely enough, because that's the only <laughs> place you can do them now. So, um, but yeah, so, but the but the whole digital soundtrack is available on iTunes and, and soundtrack as well. And Dan, um, where can people... And I wrote the songs, Chris. The Dan, lyrics. where can people find you on social media and where can they get more info about the film? Yeah, so the film, uh, 18, and I was just updating the website, 18 and a half, so it's the number 18 and then spelled out and a half movie.com. Uh, I'm at danmervish.com. Uh, uh, on social media, I'm dmervish or Dan Mervish on, on Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and Instagram and and um, and 18 and a half too. So uh, yeah, if you if you find Chris Gore, I'm, I'm usually right behind him. I do whatever Chris does on socials. <laughs> I still have a great clip of Chris saying, MySpace is the best thing. Oh my God, you gotta love MySpace. Everyone get really? on MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh, we need that. We it's need the, that. <laughs> it's the promo, if you search on YouTube, it's the promo for the open house, the musical DVD. Because we had that party, we had that release party at my house, and Chris right. was there. 
Oh um, my God. I remember that. that. Yeah. Wow. I've said some ridiculous things. Oh, I know. I, I I'm, I, I've said some incredibly ridiculous I'll things. I'll send you guys a link. Yeah. Uh, Dan, thank you for being on the show. The movie comes out uh, July, what'd you say? July 5th. 5th, yeah. Any day on now. On digital and see it in the theaters if you can. And if you're running a Dan, pick up one of those, pick up one of those 18 and a half uh, records. I think that's awesome. Dan, uh, this is not the last time you're going to be on the show. You've been on the show before. You will be on again, I promise you. Yeah. Uh, and and look up all of Dan's stuff on IMDb, his whole catalog. And I think someone mentioned earlier, maybe you brought it up. Uh, Dan is one of the founders of the Slam Dance Film Festival, one of my personal favorite film festivals. Very punk rock, very DIY. Um, very hot tub. Very hot tub. I have been in a hot tub with Dan where we did a panel in a hot tub once <laughs> yep. in Park City, Utah. And also, like, Slam Dance has an app that you can get. And what they'll do, I think it's cheap. It's like 20 bucks and you or 10 bucks, and you get like all the movies playing slam dance you can watch in a week. It's it's uh it's fantastic. Dan, yeah. uh have fun in Nebraska. Are you working on a new movie? Can you talk about it? No, this is this is I'm working on this. Like if you're not working hundred percent on the movie you're working on, you're not doing enough. So no, there I mean there's talk about about turning 18 and a half into a play and maybe as expanding as a TV series. So there's some of those ideas we're looking into, but this is going to keep me busy for a while. I still have to work on DVD and Blu-ray and and by the way, let me just say every one of my films has had a film threat quote blurb on the poster or the DVD box. Well, there that you goes go. Back 30 years. So So this is some advice for indie filmmakers out there. If you want to get a quote to throw on your DVD box, poster, whatever, we're the place to come. Dan, uh, enjoy yourself in Nebraska. Find the coolest Thanks, dive Dan. bar in Nebraska. I mean, and let me know what it is, because when I go there, uh, I'll check it out. Dan, have a great rest of your day, man. Everyone right. support this Thanks. film. Take care, Dan. Uh, 18 and a half. It's currently in it's in theaters and limited release. And also you can get you can get it next week. That's awesome. Always love to talk to Dan. He is, uh, he's great. Let's wrap up with some quick questions and comments. Actually, let's not, let's not forget that Dan is an inaugural award this winner. Oh, that's right. Dan is an award this winner back in 20, year. I want to say 2019 or 2018. I don't know. Other people pay more attention to the history of award this. Dan won for best director. So yeah. that's awesome. Let's go to our chat questions as we wrap up the show today. Matthew A. Kobo says, thank you, Dan. Internet Rec Room says, gracias, Dan. Good stuff. And then Scott Slaughterbeck says, I'm Chris Gore on MySpace. <laughs> Masters of Nerddom says, thanks, Dan. Everybody's loving Dan. We got to have him back. Uh, Jack D. Ripper says, ow, my jeans. You can find that clip. You can find that clip. It's pretty easy. Um Sean Zamir says, great interview, which is awesome. Scott Slaughterbeck also says, great interview. And Mark Clement says, Film Thread is great, and they put my no my nonsense on the screen. Yes, yes, we do. We do. JTPRX says, came in late to the show today, saw Chris on John Campia's show yesterday, and was glad to find this channel. I appreciate the honest movie-slash-TV reviews Chris gives. Thanks. What to see, what to see, RRR. What to see? What to see, want to see, what, what to see, RRR, JTPX, I, not, hey, as long as RRR gets a mention, because people do need to check it out, and Dan Mervish, oh, Dan Mervish actually posted, we should post this in the chat, um, post this in the chat. Yeah, um, I'm trying to find the spot. Uh, this is, no, to... I found it, um, it's me talking about MySpace. For about a, two minute, minute clip, about a so. minute in. We can just can yeah. we just share it and show it? Yeah, I'm trying to find your where your your part starts. It says it's about a minute in. Oh my okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna queue it up, so stick around. I'm gonna queue it up. It's about one minute in, and you're gonna see me on there. Uh okay, just I gotta uh, give me give me a second to set all this up and we'll watch it. Uh, okay. And I'm going to share this. Thank you, Dan, for sharing this. We're going to share a tab here. Make sure I do it right. Here we go. So we're going to share this video. Uh, let's see. Let's see. We'll yeah, go to a, go to a minute, go to a minute, uh, 10. 
Okay, minute 10. All right. All right. And here we go. All right. Let's see if this works, folks. Uh, here we go. This Here we go. Oh, instant banter. MySpace is what we always want websites to do. We're right. proud of, of MySpace. MySpace. <laughs> Make it funny. Funny or real. Funny or real is good. Yeah, yeah. Think of Dan Murray from Chris Columbus. Two working legs. And $50 million. And a handful of millions. All right, I can't, I can't, I can't watch myself. I can't, I can't, I can't watch myself. Uh, that was the thing when you saw, okay, that was my stomach. And what I would do is, <laughs> all right, this is a joke I used to play. I'm a big fan of doing practical jokes. So one of the practical jokes I would do is, and this was like, like family home videos that I would send my family. Okay, so when my kids were little, I would take videos of my family. Feel free to steal this joke, by the way. And what I would do is I would send my family or a friend videos of like my kids and here's what we're doing in California and whatever. I would open the video with an extreme close up of my fingers going into my hairy stomach. Now, and it was such an extreme close up. You weren't quite sure that it was a stomach. It may have been, it looked like something awful was happening. So the idea was, is my family would put in a video and they would think that I had accidentally sent them an adult film, or at least the beginning of it was an adult film. Then you snap, zoom out, zoom out, and it's actually just my stomach being fingered. So it's, it's, um, if that's a practical joke that you would like to do and participate in, I can just say that it's incredibly effective because the whole family would put in the tape. They're like, Oh, Chris, we're going to put in your tape. You know, I'd be that, you know, it'd be like a holiday and I'm like, Oh, did you get my tape? I took some videos of the kids. I'd hear them put the tape in. You'd hear the whole family scream like, ah, what did you send us? And then you zoom out. It's like 10 seconds of a hairy hold and, and fingers going in. And then, you'd go to a family. It'd be just be the family. So, video. so childish. So childish. It was, first of all, incredibly childish. And uh, my family loved it. So there you go. Mark Clement says, Chris was young once. Uh, Jeff Brooks says, Chris, you still look the same. Did you make a deal with the devil? Um, no, I just, I'm, I'm an indoor kid. So Masters of the Nerdum, Chris's goatee is epic. Shelby AC, my family would never speak to me again, lol. And then uh, Matt Jones says, was that Anthony Rapp from Days to Confuse? Yep. Matt Jones, yes, it was. Anthony Rapp was in Dan's movie, Open House. So there you go. Uh, we're going to wrap things up here uh, on a Friday because it is a holiday weekend. Some of you are listening while you're driving. You're driving to your destination. And uh, I'm just excited that we survived we survived. We survived June. We survived June. And now we're on to July and we're going to survive July and we're going to get through to the summer here. You can see Alan and I are going to be at San Diego Comic-Con uh, July 21st. Yeah, we're three weeks. A, yeah, we're, July 21st, we're doing a screening of Attack of the Dock. Details on that will come shortly. This is a rough cut of the film. This isn't the finished film. It's like a secret screening. So yeah. I'm going to let you know details. If you happen to be going to San Diego during San Diego Comic-Con and would like to see the movie, details will be forthcoming. Yeah. We should, Alan, we should mention we'll, we'll be there the, fir the Thursday, the first, first day oh, of Comic-Con. Oh, wait a second. Yes. Thursday. I think I can announce this now. We are doing a panel called uh, in, uh, Future Indies You Must See. And at that panel, what we do is we show trailers for movies that are coming out later in the year, indie movies that are weird, over-the-top, crazy documentaries, um, a lot of fun stuff. So that is at 11 a.m. It's future indies you must see, 11 a.m. Thursday, July 21st. If you're going to be at San Diego Comic-Con, join us at that screening um, or join us at that panel, and the screening is that night at 7 p.m. in the San Diego area. Details forthcoming. Mm -hmm. Alan, where can people find you? Film Threat. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, my pal Al on Twitter. Uh, Film Threat Alan on Instagram. And then you can read our reviews at filmthreat.com. Uh, go ahead. Don't, don't, let, don't let Alan's 
performance on the podcast fool you. <laughs> he is capable of thinking on his feet. He's capable of thinking on his feet. I've seen him do it. I've seen Alan it perform. Wait a second, are you performing at the National Comedy Theater during that weekend? I yeah, I will be on Friday night in San Diego. I got Friday plans then. Yeah. We're going to go see Alan at the National Comedy Theater on Friday night. Yeah. Nationalcomedy.com. National is it what is it? Nationalcomedy.com. Nationalcomedy.com. We'll give you more reminders as we get closer. Uh Alan, it's all yes. Jack D. Ripper says, improv master. Hustle. Oh, no, Alan, <laughs> come on. Uh, improv master in the making. Anyways, that's going to get clipped. Um, that's going to get clipped and blown up. Flaccid Phoenix, don't forget this. Uh, I want to say thank you to everyone in the chat. Great questions today. I love that you, you are, you know, we're talking about things like Thor, Love and Thunder, but you stick around for the reviews of the indie movies. And I appreciate that. I know like a lot, there's, you know, a lot is focused on the big movies. We focus, we talk about the big movies, but we also talk about other movies to make you aware of what else is out there. And then we bring you the filmmakers so you can talk to them directly. And I appreciate all your great questions and comments. Thank you for that. Have a great holiday weekend. I'm going to be seeing fireworks on the fourth. Uh, I'm going to be eating barbecue somewhere <laughs> and appreciate you. Thank you for listening. Like, share, subscribe. You know all that stuff. And we will be back next Wednesday for Hollywood on the Rocks. And a week from today, our spoiler-filled review of Thor Love and Thunder a week from today because then you'll have had an opportunity to see it. And I always prefer to have these conversations when you've seen the movie. It just makes it its a more two-way conversation because I want to hear what you thought. I want to hear, you know, are we off base is Alan too overpraising? Am I underselling it? You know, see for yourself. We want to hear your opinions. Alan, take us out for the holiday weekend. And I know you are rushing to the store because uh, this is what I do after Halloween. All the Halloween candies, 50% off. Now you can get, um, I guess you can get Pride Oreo cookies for 50% yeah. off. Oh, they're all going to be, everything's 50% off now. So there you go. Alan? Let's get out of here. All right, let's do that. Yeah. <laughs>